the citizens of the 11th district. I will start by introducing the nominating committee and then my council colleagues that are in attendance. Um, I am Carl Stokes, chair of the nominating uh, committee. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Councilman Jim Kraft of the first council district, uh, also a member of this particular committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then our committee members, please acknowledge uh, as your name is called, sorry, Morgan Alcalay from the South Baltimore Neighborhood Association. Thanks. Uh, Wanda Bess, Upton Planning Committee. Shane Laporte, Riverside Neighborhood Association. Uh, Janet Allen, Heritage Crossing Residents Association. Shane Mitchell, Green Door Properties. Uh, Kelly Little, resident of Drude Heights. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Uh, Michael Evitz, Downtown Partnership. Um, Adrian Harpool, resident of Madison Park. Andy Freeman, resident of Harbor View. Joseph Palumbo, resident of Bolton Hill. Dr. Charles Simmons, resident of Federal Hill. Thank you. Um, the president of the city council has appointed uh, this committee um, is, uh, of course, uh, here with us uh, this evening, Mr. President, uh, to acknowledge. Um, sitting in, uh, to my far left is Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton of the 6th Council District, uh, and to her left is uh, Councilman Robert Bobby Karen of the 3rd uh, Council District. Are there any other members in the room now? Uh, to my immediate left will be um, Mr. Larry Green, um, staff to this committee. Uh, behind me is uh, Ms. Kara Kant's legislative uh, um, staff to the president and also staff to this committee. And Bill Driscoll, uh, chief of staff to the president of the city council. Um, and um, uh, give me a name. Uh, who else is back there? Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move forward tonight. Let me, if I might, just speak to, um, as required by law, notice has been provided to inform the public of this hearing. It has also described uh, the criteria of the candidates, that the candidates are required to fulfill. Candidates must be at least 18 years old, have lived within the boundaries of the 11th district for at least one year, and be a registered voter. Those interested in being considered for the position were directed to submit the following items at 4.30 p.m. by 4.30 p.m. last Wednesday, September 17. A copy of their resume, a copy of photo identification with proof of age and address, and a copy of their voter registration card. This evening, the nominating committee will interview the candidates in a public forum. Before we begin, I want to go over the rules of procedure for this evening's session. The committee will proceed this evening by calling the candidates for it individual, individually and in random order. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds to provide us with an opening statement, 90 seconds to answer six questions each, and 90 seconds to give a closing statement. The six questions were generated by this committee and the candidates were given a list of questions yesterday afternoon. Mr. Green, who is uh, standing behind me, will give you a signal when your 90 seconds has ended and we will ask you the next question. Each candidate has been invited to bring one reference with them this evening if they choose to, and that is the only oral testimony on the candidates that will be taken this evening. I will acknowledge the written communication sent in regard to the candidates when they are called up for their interview. So at this point, uh, this is divided into uh, two sections this evening. At this point, I ask that anyone who would like to provide comments on the procedures of this committee and how the vacancy is being filled to please line up at the podium uh, in the center of the chamber here. This is for comments only on the procedures, not on any individual's candidacy. Is there anyone who wish to speak to the procedure that we're about to move forward with this evening. Name, I'm sorry. 
Curry. My name is Lewis Fields, and I just wanted to make a public comment that I believe the process has been open, fair, and very transparent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a good start. Uh, if there are no other comments, then we will uh, begin with the individual candidates. Um, I have before me the 14 names of candidates. The, actually, 15 individuals submitted the proper documentation within the prescribed time frame. However, here are the candidates who we will hear from this evening. Melanie Ambridge, Daryl Cribb, Eric T. Costello, Julie K. Dunham Howie, John Kutzgar, Rob LePen, Arthur McGravey, Harry F. Preston V, William Romani, Greg Cilio, Benjamin R. Smith, David Stone, Shannon Sullivan, and Anthony F. Victoria. The 15th candidate, Shannon Laurie Keeney, withdrew her application last Thursday. The remaining 14 candidates, as I mentioned, we will interview in the next few minutes. With that being said, we will move forward with the public interviews. I actually will call uh, the first and second uh, names, and so uh, the first candidate obviously can come right to the microphone, um, and um, the uh, second candidate can be prepared to move forward. Again, in random order, the first, shall, the last shall be first. Anthony F. Victoria. Thank you, sir. Uh, you uh, may take 90 seconds to give you an opening statement. Just a point of procedure, uh, uh, Councilman Stokes, should I have my sponsor speak first or after I present? Um, we'll take that first. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. I would like to um, uh, introduce uh, Chris Rich. He's a resident of Locust Point and a former president and vice president of the Locust Point Civic Association. Thank you. Good evening, committee. Um, I have known Mr. Vittoria. Would you restate your name for us, please? I'm sorry. My name is uh, Christopher Rich. I live in Locust Point. Thank you. Uh, I've known Mr. Vittoria, Tony, for about uh, eight, nine years now. Um, as a friend, is also a person who worked with the community. Uh, and in both cases where I served under him as, a, as, a, as the Locust Point president, or when he was my vice president, in all cases, he was the smartest guy in the room. And he made the community a better place for him for his involvement. I think it's important when you make a choice is to have a person who has experience and and passion. And he definitely has the passion. And I'm sure all the all the, the candidates do as well. But the experience that we have in Locust Point, dealing with large developers like Pat Turner, Mark Saperstein or large Fortune 500,000 companies like Under Armour, which is right in our backyard, is something that he can bring to the, to the, uh, to the council for his insight and just his, his experience. And not only that, I mean, he, he, he is just volunteers for, for, for anything, anything he wants to do. He's been involved for over, over 10 years. That's a very long tenure time for a, locus, for a local community association. I'm proud to know him as a friend, and I'm proud to know him, to be able to work with him on, on, the, on the, the Locust Point Civic Association. And he's the right candidate. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. We're ready, sir. OK. Uh, thank you, uh, committee. I appreciate your dedication, your time that you're taking for this. Uh, Chair Councilman Stokes, uh, members of the City Council, President Young, I appreciate your time. And I agree with the individual who spoke earlier. This has been a, a wonderful procedure. It's been open and it's been fair, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, now, and I'm going to save my sales pitch for the last 90 seconds. My name is Anthony Vittoria. I've lived in um, the 11th district, what is now the 11th district since 1997. I grew up in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I went to the University of Virginia uh, for undergraduate and for law school with a stop in between at the College of William & Mary for a master's degree in psychology. 
Um, following law school, I clerked for one year at the Federal District Court in Alexandria, Virginia, and then I came up to Baltimore. Came up to Baltimore, interestingly, turning down an offer in Washington, D.C. I fell in love with Baltimore when I interned for a law firm in the summer of 1995 and wanted to come back. Um, moved to Belt Street in Riverside, lived there for about a year, moved to Woodall Street, also in Riverside, excuse me, Webster Street, also in, in Riverside for about five years, and have since moved to Woodall Street in Locust Point and have lived there for about 11 years. Um, so that's 17 years. That whole time, I've lived in the 11th District and I have worked in the 11th District. I've worked for two law firms downtown. I'm familiar with what's going on with the city and what's going on with my neighborhood and the neighborhoods in the peninsula in the 11th District. I got involved in the Locust, well, I was involved in the Riverside Action Group, what it was called at that time, but I got involved in the Locust Point Civic Association about 2004. You finish your sentence. Uh, thank you, Anna, and I've been uh, active ever since, continuously volunteering, up until Saturday when we had our festival and spent all day out there. Thank you. Thank you. So the first of six questions. What is your view of development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, such as the Harbor Development and State Center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developments? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe, uh, twofold, I believe that the Inner Harbor is to some extent nearing capacity. I believe that there has been enough development in the Inner Harbor. Uh, you know, a choice project here or there would be great. Conversely, and, I, and I've often said on the side that sometimes it feels like we're, we're cramming 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag, but uh, conversely, I, I believe that there should be development in other parts of the city. So the State Center, a project like the State Center, is, is entirely appropriate. Let's get the development outside of the half mile radius around the Inner Harbor. My, my motto for this is really, let's spread the wealth and the, the prosperity. I'm not talking about redistributing it, I'm talking about spread it. Let's get it outside of that, that arc. And I feel like um, the City Council should be protecting the neighborhoods during that development. Um, developers are powerful, they have lots of money. I've dealt with them in Locust Point. They um, bring in their lawyers, they bring in their um, consultants and their architects, and, and so the people need a body like this to help look out for their interests in a lot of those situations. Um, so again, uh, I, I feel twofold. Enough development in the Urner Harbor or close to enough development, but we need more development in other parts of the city. Thank you, sir. Second question. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th District? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th District, especially under Martin Luther King, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? That, that's a lot of stuff in that question. I'm going to try to address it. Again, I'm going to encourage development in the areas in the 11th District outside of the Inner Harbor. Um, I think that there's room for development in those areas. And if you look at some of those areas, one of the things that we have in the city, for example, are food deserts throughout the city. Let's encourage the development of a supermarket in one of these food deserts. That'll you know, make that development, that community, that much more livable for the people that are there. It'll attract more people. It'll create jobs. That's the kind of thing we need to do. As far as homelessness, that's a tough, multifaceted issue. Um, you know, the studies show that with, uh, especially with the recession, but there are a lot of working people that are on thin line from being in a home and being homeless. So one of the issues that we really need to look at here in Baltimore is affordable housing for those individuals. And we also need to make sure that they have availability to a, sa a safety net in case they have a divorce, they have an illness, they lose a job for a couple months, that they automatically are not immediately evicted from their rental apartments or their homes and are then homeless. Other issues include, uh, there's a lot of people that have mental illness that are homeless. Um, I believe in treatment of those individuals. Uh, you really need to treat the underlying issue prior to uh, finding them homes. I mean, you want to find them places to live as well, but you need to treat the drug abuse, the mental issue, the PTSD, whatever it, they are suffering from that has got them out in that street situation. Thank you. Uh, question three. Considering what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. 
Thank you. I believe that the two top issues in the 11th district, it might be different in different districts, but in the 11th district are wealth distribution and crime. Um, as noted in the previous question, I mean, there are some wonderful neighborhoods in the 11th district. I live in one. Locust Point is a wonderful neighborhood. I, you know, I feel blessed almost every day living in that neighborhood. Um, but places like Harbor East and places like even like Locust Point, the rich just kind of keep getting richer. The development keeps occurring in those places. We got this wonderful new field that Under Armour built. It's great, but let's see some of those kind of developments and those kind of benefits in other parts of the city. Um, again, I'm going to go back to my theme. Let's spread the wealth. Let's not redistribute the wealth, but let's spread it to other parts of the city. In regards to crime, I'm encouraged by the drop in homicides in the city, and we are lucky that the 11th doesn't see as much crime as other parts of the city. But crime still touches a lot of us. In fact, I had my house broken into back in December of 2013. Just a property crime. They broke in the back door and they stole some stuff, but it still touches all of us. So we need to address that issue as well, even those of us in the 11th district in comfortable neighborhoods like Locust Point. It's a quality of life issue and we need to, to do what we can, and that includes increased training for police officers, if possible, additional police officers. Um, it it uh, includes, I believe, increased foot patrol, um, if possible. I know that that might not always be possible, but let's get the, the, the police officers out in the street um, and, and, and interacting with the public, and, and especially in trouble spots. Thank you. Do you subscribe, question four, do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Uh, again, it depends, and I, I don't mean I don't say that to, to be evasive. I think that you probably have gotten the theme of where I'm coming from. I don't believe that we need incentives to get development in the Inner Harbor area anymore. Baltimore has got to get over this, to the extent it still exists, but this kind of inferiority complex where we got to pay people to come. People, Baltimore is a great city. People want to be here. I have friends in D.C. I grew up in Virginia. A lot of my friends in D.C., they talk great of Baltimore. They're you know, often jealous of the fact that I live up here. We don't need to, to provide incentives for those big developers to come in that area. But at the same time, I, I fully support considering incentives for development in the less developed, less prosperous areas. I think that that's important. I was recently up at Humanum, um, which is in the old uh, American Brewery building in uh, the uh, Broadway East neighborhood, and I think that's a wonderful development. It gave that neighborhood a shot in the arm, um, and, and that's the kind of thing that I would support, and I would propose incentives for, for that kind of development. Thank you. We've been joined by Councilman Warren Branch, 13th District, and I did fail to note since we're on this subject that the uh, President's uh, economic development guru, uh, Carolyn Blakeney, is also here uh, with us. Uh, pardon me for missing you earlier. Uh, question five. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently, if you would? Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, again, I'm encouraged by the reduction in the homicides, but homicides only tell part of the story. Um, there's still a lot of property crimes, and I believe that we can do more. Um, I mean, you know, it'd be great to say, let's get more officers. That might not be fiscally possible. But I think what we can do is we can better train our officers, especially those officers in kind of, I want to call the middle management, the, 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 the fellows that are out there leading the, the, the foot soldiers in the fight against crime. Um, you know, there have been numerous examples where the state's attorney's office simply does not have the admissible evidence to prosecute a crime or maybe has to take a lesser plea because of improper evidence gathering, those sorts of things. So I, I think that, that we can make strides in our policing efforts. In regard to community relations, and, and Chris and, and Greg will know about this, we have Butterbean, who is a wonderful, uh, uh, he's an officer, he's our community li liaison officer. He's wonderful, but I'm sure that there are not, there are other neighborhoods who don't. And I, I believe for those neighborhoods, like I said, getting officers out of the cruisers and onto the streets would be a wonderful thing. And finally, I, I fully support the proposal by Council President Young and Cal uh, Councilman Branch uh, about the, the body cameras. I think that's a wonderful idea. I think that's going to instill some trust in the community and their officers. It's going to um, hopefully provide evidence for prosecuting crime. It's going to cut down on any kind of abuse that I, I believe that might may occur. And I think hopefully it'll cut down on the millions of dollars in settlements that we're paying for these alleged abuse cases. So I, I fully support that measure. 
Thank you, and the final question. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. Well, again, it would be nice to say let's have smaller classes and, and more teachers, but that just might not be physically, po physically possible. I think that the um, excellence of our schools and improvement in our schools depends on leadership. And I think that something that we can do is focus on the principals in those schools. Focus on getting good leaders in the schools, good principals. And those principals can um, just change the culture of a school. They can recruit and retain highly qualified teachers. And they can effectively set and maintain behavioral and performance standards for the kids. We need those kind of leaders. So what we have to do is we have to recruit quality leaders. We have to recruit quality principals. We have to do that. We have to go out of state. We will have to do that. But once we establish those quality principles in our schools, I think we should set up a mentoring system whereby those quality established principles mentor principals who may be newer at their job or are in less quality established situations. So let's focus on the leadership in the schools. Let's get those principals to set an example both in the schools to their teachers, to the students, but also to other principals in other schools. Thank you. Uh, and your closing statement, please. Uh, thank you, and I, again, I appreciate your time. I know it's going to be, oops, <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> That's a trick. Um, I appreciate your time and your dedication to this. It's really wonderful that you all uh, volunteered to do this, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, I think, uh, as, as Mr. Rich uh, said before, I'm a doer. When I was involved in the community association, I did things. I did park cleanups. I did cop walks. I met with you know, community individuals. Um, even this weekend, I was at our festival all, week, um, all day long. I had put in hours before, <laughs> dozens of hours before setting it up. And I'm no longer an officer. I'm not somebody who is doing this to, to go on to higher office. I feel like I would be absolutely wonderful at this job because I will sit down and I will get the work done. Um, and I think that that's something that you know, the city may need. Let's not, you know, I don't think we need a politician. I think we need somebody who's going to get the job done. And I definitely think that I'm the person who will do that. But I also have the experience. I've dealt with Mr. Saperstein. I've dealt with Kevin Plank. I've dealt with you know, Mr. Turner. Uh, I've dealt with those hundreds of millions of dollars of projects that have occurred in Locust Point. And, um, and I, I think that those guys, they might not like me, but I, I think they'll tell you that they respect me from my negotiations with those people. So again, I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you, members of the City Council. Mr. Victoria, we thank you uh, for coming forward and to offering uh, to serve. Uh, we thank you very much. Um, we will move forward with the process, and uh, if you'd like to remain, it, it is possible, depending on the will of the committee, that there may be a vote tonight. I don't know that depending on the will of the committee later this evening. Let me mention uh, that you. we do have letters of support, and there may have been others uh, that we didn't uh, capture, but Chris Rich, uh, Karen Johns, Shannon Cavalier uh, have all forwarded. Uh, we're joined by Councilwoman Ricky Spector of the 5th Council District. Councilwoman, how are you this evening? Um, Great, good to see you. So I'm gonna call the next two names um, to come before us, beginning with uh, first B. Shannon Sullivan. And following procedure, am I to bring up If my you would like, yes. All right, thank you, uh, Councilman Stokes and uh, other distinguished members of the committee. My name is John Perre, and I live and work in the 11th District. In May 2005, Ms. Shannon began a crusade to try to fix 1701 Light Street. 1701 Light Street was the kind of house and home that you did not want near you. It was dangerous. The people in there were doing drugs. They brought a bad element to the neighborhood. It's the kind of house that everyone in the area, everyone in the area worked to avoid walking by there. But Ms. Sullivan took it on. And in 2008, she had it declared a drug nuisance home. And in September 2013, it was auctioned by the city 
and now is being developed and lived uh, by very nice people. This was awesome work by Ms. Sullivan and really was advantageous to not only the district but the whole city. In addition to this, she has worked for the past 11 years with the Riverside Neighborhood Association and her work there demonstrates several key features or uh, elements that I think that she could bring to the city council. Number one, her ability to listen. Number two, her leadership. Three, her ability to create teamwork. It took a team of people to help fix 1701 Light Street. Her follow through. It took years to fix it and she stuck with it. Her ability to be courageous. She had to testify in, co in court with the people standing right next to her who had, who had lived previously in 1701 Light Street and her ability to simply work tenaciously to improve this city. I live and work and shop in the 11th district. This city means a lot to me. I plan to live here for the rest of my life. And that is why I support Shannon Sullivan for the next councilwoman of the 11th district. And I urge you to appoint her to that position. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that Thank very you. much. Ms. Sullivan, uh, you may, when you're prepared, begin your 90-second opening. Thank you. Can everyone, can everyone hear me OK? OK. Thank you for your time this evening. I applied for the 11th District Council position because I have the professional, personal, and volunteer experience to be effective and tireless advocate for residents of the 11th district. I have spent 11 years uh, working with my neighborhood association and countless volunteer okay. hours to improve not just my neighborhood, but neighborhoods throughout the city. For example, I hope, helped um, co-start COP walks, Citizens on Patrol walks, in neighborhoods like Locust Point and Federal Hill, but also in Cherry Hill and Westport, Mount Winans, Brooklyn, Curtis Bay, Carrollton Ridge, and I could go on. Professionally, I was a congressional staffer where I um, helped respond to over 10,000 constituent and legislative requests. And I currently work for the Baltimore Police Department where I use my analytical and critical thinking skills and policy expertise to help improve the department from the inside out so it can better serve and protect the citizens of Baltimore. And personally, I am a mom to two kids who attend Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, and I've worked hard to, um, even before the kids went to school there, worked hard to improve the infrastructure. And now in my current role as an elected member of the parent advisory team, I work on budget issues and curriculum. In summary, I have the proven results as an oriented leader, um, results oriented leader uh, with a passion for improving safety, schools, and overall city life for families and residents. and working with neighborhoods versus large developers. Okay, I believe that development is necessary, but it, we need to have it focused so that it's smart and it is responsible. And by smart, let's put development near transportation centers. And by responsible, we have to sit down and figure out how, who benefits from the development? How does it impact the immediate community? You know, are there pedestrian um, safety issues? Is there parking? Are there parking issues? Uh, all of those things need to be thoroughly reviewed. And um, what role should the city play? Well, the, you have the Baltimore Development Corporation, which does a fantastic job of bringing in new businesses and development to the city. But as a city council person, I feel that it would be my role to advocate for the residents as well. Um, you have to strike a balance. You have to listen to both sides. There are pros and cons to every single development um, project that comes into the city. And you know, I have to help facilitate progress. Uh, development uh, is great, but it shouldn't come at the expense of residents who live here. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th districts? 
How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? Okay. This, I think, is where development can be really helpful. I know Tony talked about um, you know, the food deserts that we have. Let's get some more grocery stores into neighborhoods where people have to, the only option is the corner store that sells like, you know, candy and gum. That's not good enough. Uh, we also need to do things like improve our public transportation system. You know, I had to leave my house about 40 minutes earlier than I would have if I had a car, because I don't, and I got on the circulator with my kids and we came down here. And the circulator is far more reliable than the one or the 64 or any of the other buses that people use. And we really need to do more to help make those lines more modern and efficient. Um, regarding the homeless issue, you know, that's a very complex issue. A lot of the homeless in our city have very severe uh, mental health issues, and it prevents them a lot of times from using shelters. And shelters should be temporary anyway. And you know, we have organizations like Journey Home, where they've gone out and talked to um, the most vulnerable of the homeless in our communities and determined that finding them um, homes to live in not only helps them stabilize their lives um, and makes them healthier, but it health cuts down on health care costs as well. Considering what you know about the entire 11th District, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. OK. First one is always public safety. Uh, you know, when I first moved here, within the first year, our house got broken into and our car got broken into. And instead of just complaining about it, I decided I would do something about it. And 11 years later, you know, I still am the neighborhood crime person, and I even got hired by the Baltimore Police Department. Um, you know, on the community level, we need to improve communication with the Baltimore Police Department. They need to outreach um, to us faster uh, when crime incidents occur. We need to provide them with proper resources, and we have to continue to, to push for community involvement. Uh, the other priority, I believe, is holding city agencies accountable. You know, as taxpayers, we, um, we need better services. We know we're paying for these services, and yet I can't, sometimes I don't, I don't know what I'm getting for my service. Uh, you know, I've had issues with housing and parks and rec, where we've asked them to explain how things have, you know, why we aren't getting pool chairs or why a structural inspection wasn't done five years ago on a property. Uh, and, I, and the response is, oh, we dropped the ball. Well, that's not good enough. I should have gotten a response, not only did we drop the ball, this is why it happened, and this is how we're going to fix it. We really need to improve how the city um, responds to constituent services. You know, taxpayers pay money. We deserve, um, we deserve them to do their job. Before I ask the next question, we've been joined by the Vice President of the City Council from the 10th District, Councilman Ed Reisinger. Uh, <clears throat> do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? And please explain your response. Yes, to a degree. Uh, development is undoubtedly critical for growth. But I think as a city, we often sell ourselves too short. We have a lot to offer here, and I don't think we need to bend over backwards to bring in developers to areas that are already um, stable and desirable, or waterfront property, for example. Uh, we need to also improve tracking. You know, if we've had developers in the past come to us and say, these are all the jobs we're going to bring, and, and these are all the great things we're going to bring to the city, what's the follow-up? Have we, have we done that to figure out if it's really delivered on that promise? And if not, is it because the city didn't do what we should have done? Is it something with the developer? We need to do a better um, job of tracking that. And development shouldn't come at the expense of other parts of the city. For example, the downtown central bus dis business district, which is the 11th district, has a 20 percent approximately office, office vacancy rate. You know, how do we make sure that, you know, Harbor East development is great, but how do we make sure that doesn't pull from other areas of the city? How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department, and what would you do differently? Okay. Well, I, I do work for the police department now, and in fact, I work for the Office of Internal Oversight, which is underneath the Professional Standards and Accountability Bureau, and I work specifically on the force investigation team. And the whole point is to increase, um, you know, 
accountability and transparency. As soon as an officer uses categorical force, we're putting that information up online so that citizens can see it. Um, but no matter what the murder rate is, uh, we can always do more to improve the relationship between the police and the community. And there are lots of different ways to do it, whether it's through religious groups or community groups. That is something that regardless of, you know, regardless of the crime rate is something that the police can always strive to continue to do. It's just, okay. um, and then I, I also, um, the body camera idea, you know, I sit in rooms now where I read a victim st or a suspect statement and a police officer statement and then I watch the video and these things don't always match up. <laughs> and so having the, the body camera, if we can start off small and it can prove that when not only are we decreasing the complaints against officers, against officers, but that officers are using less force and that everyone is safer, then we owe it to ourselves to really try and make that work. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how would you recommend the city act upon that factor? Okay, aside from constantly pushing for funding to the state, I think one of the best things that the city can do, or North Avenue can do, is increase parent involvement. You know, we have, uh, or my kids go to school, last year, 89% of the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders there qualified for free and reduced student lunch, yet those kids exceeded their peers in testing. And it goes to show you that it's not just about money, but it's also about parent involvement. And a lot of places, parents don't know how, how they can impact their students, and they always feel that it's always about money, and so I need, I want the school system to step up, in particular with the family community engagement specialists. Um, you know, I know that we've, we had to reach out to them as a PTO, and we discovered it was like the third, we, we had a new person, it's the third one in about two years. You know, these people need to push harder and help parents understand that they can make powerful impacts and help the school and the students. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan. You now may take 90 for your closing okay. statement. My experience as a mom and a community leader proves that I am dedicated to improving city life for families, residents, and businesses. Whether it's removing an owner-occupied drug nuisance property, to installing stop signs and cr uh, safety crosswalks near the school, I will always fight for improving our city. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you. Very, very nicely done. We appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Sullivan has approximately 50 uh, give or take a few uh, letters of support. Uh, and again, we may not have captured everything. I did read uh, the previous names. I, and um, no less weight to them, I will not read the names of every um, writer, supporter. Uh, this is before the committee. It is in our file, and the committee has uh, copies of uh, the letters that we have. Uh, so thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Malumbo, you have a question of clarity? Yeah, can I uh, ask a question, uh, Shannon, just to, for you to clarify? When you answered the first question, you said uh, that you thought that uh, Baltimore should support development uh, near the transportation centers. But then in the fourth question, you said that Baltimore should not support development if it was at the expense of down t uh, the vacancy rates downtown. So just as clarification, do you support the Uh, maybe we misunderstood each other, but. <laughs> Would you restate it? Uh, the, so Did you understand the question? The I think so. Point? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, what I was saying was that, um, like Harbor East, for example, shouldn't pull away from development in downtown. And I, you know, I know the state center is right by the uh, the light rail. Uh, and I think that's great. I think the State Center has some additional problems. It's sort of like this weird suburban island where you do have the light rail, but you can't walk to anything else because you have MLK there, and the only thing that's there are businesses. You don't have, you know, if you were to, to go there, there's no place to eat. There's no, um, so I think that, you know, you have to look at each project individually. I think ideally they should always be near strong transportation centers. Does that help clarify? Yeah, they do. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other points of clarification? There being none, I, the next uh, candidate before us is David Stone, who will be followed by Arthur McGreevy.
Good evening, <laughs> Dr. Stone. Did you bring someone who you wish to? I didn't. I had some confusion today and um, didn't have the heart to ask someone to sit here for six hours and wait <laughs> to speak about me. So I do not. All right. Then you have 90 um, seconds, sir, for your opening uh, statement. Give me one second here, if you don't mind. Well, good evening. My name is David Stone, and obviously I'm here to ask to be your representative of the 11th Council District. <clears throat> I'm meeting many of you for the first time tonight, which is something that surprises me because I've worked in every one of your neighborhoods for the last 10 years working with the school system. And that's why I'm here tonight. <clears throat> As you may have heard, I am the vice chairman of the Baltimore City School Board and I have seen a lot of things in our school system that the school system itself can't solve. We have those children 15% of the, of the time, the rest of the time they're with us in the community. And there are many things that we are gonna talk about tonight that affect children and families. And I'm here to say that my knowledge of what goes on in our school system will extend out into all areas of this city because the most important thing that we need to do is to make this a family-friendly city, which currently I'm not sure that it is. I live in this city. I've lived in Baltimore since 1980. I have lived in the district for the last 14 years. Um, I've worked all over the district. I worked at Gilmore Elementary School for five years. I helped begin schools like Midtown and the Young Women's Leadership Academy in Montessori, which isn't in our district, but a lot of our families enjoy that school. And I was there to help those things get started. I also have worked very hard at um, making certain that our neighborhoods in our, in, our, in our district get their piece of what's going on in the school system. Those of you that live in, a, in the peninsula recognize that we have not had advanced programming at our schools for years. This year, I can happily say that all three schools in the peninsula have advanced programming. And that's something that we fought for very hard on the school system. Thank you. Good um, enough. I'm going to ask um, committee member uh, Adrian Harpool to uh, uh, do the question period of this. Thank you, Mr. Harpool. Good evening. Could you give, take, pull that microphone. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Stone, um, the first question is, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e., the harbor development versus and um, state center versus neighborhood development in communities? And what role should the city play in working in neighbor with neighborhoods versus large developers? Sure. Well, the city should absolutely be part of targeting areas for growth. And I think one of the things that we uh, <clears throat> fail to utilize as much as we can is the Baltimore Development Corporation. And we're fortunate that the current leader of the Baltimore Development Corporation understands the issues in District 11 very well. And I know that that group is committed to not only developing those areas that are big projects, but moving the development out into the communities where they really need that help. I would work with the corporation side by side to make sure that our neighborhoods got what they needed to start businesses. There are so many families that I see where jobs is the issue. A number of times tonight we're gonna to come across different issues, whether it's crime, homelessness, education, and jobs are a big part of that. But the jobs can't all be concentrated in one area of the city, and businesses can't only exist in one area of the city. So while those large projects are important and we need to do everything we can to draw large companies in, it's critically important that the outlying areas of the district receive attention receive guidance and training on how to start small businesses, and recognize that without the entire district being successful, then no part of our district is really successful. Thank you. Uh, the city has uh, created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in District 11? And how would you suggest transform transforming some of the pockets of poverty and homelessness in the thriving mixed neighborhood communities. Um, how would you deal with homelessness issues in our district, especially along Martin Luther King Avenue and under 83? Uh, the use, 
of the community foundations is something that I will work closely with. I've had a lot of experience with our philanthropic community here. Um, and that is an area where we can use those dollars to leverage other dollars through reinvestment fund and other places like, and other organizations like that. One of the main issues that we have in parts of our district is uh, vacant housing. And that's something that we must address because vacant housing is one reason that people won't move to a neighborhood, unquestionably. We need more attention to creating green spaces for families because that's going to bring more people here. One of the things that we love about living downtown, I live in Otterbein with my wife and three kids, and we're so happy about the green spaces because it makes us feel that the city is a livable space, but I don't see that in every single community, and we need to make sure that that happens. In terms of homelessness, let's face it, a person is homeless for two reasons. Either there's a mental illness or some sort of addiction, or there's joblessness. No one would choose to be homeless. I do think there's great promise in the Journey Home uh, program that's being instituted, but we need to have access to health care. It's so important. We need to have access to jobs. We need access to affordable housing. All the things that the research says, it's clear, works. We're not doing enough of that. And I intend to work very closely with the different agencies in our city to make sure that these issues are addressed. It is a terrible safety issue on those roads when uh, people are panhandling and trying to get money that they desperately need, but it is a huge safety issue. And we need to address it quickly. Thank the you. first thing people see when they walk into, drive into our city sometimes are folks who need. And I'm not sure that's the message we want to send to our community, and the only way to fix that is to fix homelessness. Considering what you know about the entire uh, district, uh, what are the two of the primary issues that you think are priorities? Well, the first issue is one that I'm very close to, and that is the 21st century building plan that is going on in the city right now. And while it's a schools project, I'll tell you it is an opportunity for this city to really change the face of a lot of neighborhoods. Each of these buildings will, each of these school buildings will incorporate community space. Each of these will have opportunities for retail, for health services, all kinds of opportunities, and we can't squander this. Um, the nation's watching us with this, and I'll go more into that later. The other thing is smart development. We need to, make, we need to have development that makes sense for families. We need financing that makes sense, as we heard earlier, and I think it's a very valid point. There's no sense financing things that would already uh, increase revenue and would already be gaining revenue from just the fact of natural growth. The other issue is that a lot of these, time, a lot of these um, projects that we go, are, there's not enough transparency. People are not involved in the decision making that's going to affect their lives. And so when we look at that, we need to make sure that there's workforce development so that people in the community benefit from all this growth. And again, we need to work with the BDC because they're the key to the city. A, a city that is successful has a great relationship between its development corporation and its city council. Uh, related to that, do you subscribe to the idea of financial incentives for um, businesses and developers to lure them to the city? I do, but with great reservations. I think that's something that requires uh, hitting a sweet spot. You wanted a target approach to bring businesses, and that's very critical, and financial incentives are sometimes necessary, but there's sometimes problems with incentives. TIFs, pilots, you know, you can forego taxes that you would have gained without any of this development. So you have to be careful about what you're doing. You can expand TIFs too greatly to, to, to or pilots too, too far, and so they're already abutting against development that would have already occurred, and there's no need to provide incentives for that. Um, and even, when we, when we do have to do pilots and TIFs, it's so critical that we have transparency and that community members are involved in this because a lot of times we've seen that these things just happen and then they're done. And there's not much opportunity for the public to, to speak about what their needs are. And some of those needs have to do with jobs, about creating jobs, about linking with schools to make certain that there's internships for, for students so that we can continue developing our future generations of taxpayers. 
And sometimes that's going to require financing. But the thing that we have to be careful about again when we do these things is to be careful not to lead our city into things like gentrification where we're pushing out the folks that we're trying to help. So it's a very careful balancing act. And financing does play a huge part because we need to attract certain businesses. We just have to be very thoughtful about it so we don't have unintended consequences. Thank you. Um, how do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and the relationship between the police department and the community? And what would you do differently? I'm not sure differently is the right word. Maybe more of some things and less of others. I'm very um, encouraged by the, the last two police administrations, their efforts to move into the communities more, to have more access with folks, to let people know who they are and what they do, and that they're there to help. But we really need to continue to focus on quality of life crimes. Those are the things that drive people crazy. Auto theft, burglary. I, I'm not denying that violent crimes are critically important. But when it comes to quality of life, these minor crimes have to be addressed. We have to continue to have strong outreach to the police department, from, to the police department and from the police department to the communities. Some things that I would also stress would be safe passages to school. I know that the mayor has been talking about that and I think that's a great idea because we have a lot of problems with, we have school choice in our city, but kids won't go to certain neighborhoods because they don't feel safe because there's gangs that, that they don't belong to. That's ridiculous. You can't have a school system that has f full choice and yet choices aren't available to some children. And we need to have better communication with school police as long as we're on the subject because quite frankly the communication between the city police and the school police is not as good as it could be. So with those improvements, I do think that we're going in the right direction. We've seen the crime numbers drop, but there's still a long way to go. And most importantly, it's about making sure that families and children feel safe in the city so that they stay. This may be an easy question for you, but uh, be not. What do, you, what do you feel to be one of the factors that could most effectively improve the city's education system? And how would you recommend the city act upon that factor? I've, ten, I've had 10 years to think about this answer. Well, luckily, I get two bites at this apple. So I did the first part. The school board hired a man that I consider to be an incredibly great superintendent. He is bright. He is the first superintendent that I've worked with that actually has experience in the job. He has pinpointed all the problems in our school district quicker than, than I've uh, seen any superintendent do. Tonight we are voting on a, uh, a debt policy and a fund balance policy, something that I'd asked for for five years, and in three months this guy was able to do it. But city council doesn't do that. That's school board. What the city council does have to work with, though, is that Dr. Thornton can't do it alone. He needs our help. As I said, 15% of the day is in school, 85% of the day is in the community. We have to complement them. After school programs, we cannot substitute after school uh, recreation centers for curfews. That doesn't make sense for children and families in my mind. We have a 21st century plan and I'm gonna keep beating this into everyone's head because even if I don't, get selected tonight, I need for folks in this room to know how important this project is. The entire country is watching what we're doing on this project. This is the largest per capita public works project that's going on in the United States, uh, in school districts today. We have great opportunity to turn things around, but it is going to require extraordinary cooperation between the city council, the mayor, and the school system. And to have someone on the city council who knows this thing, who's on the committee that designed this thing, who knows it inside and out. We have schools in our district that are year one schools that have to be addressed immediately. We have schools in our district, many schools unfortunately, that are year nine and 10 schools. And those schools require phase two funding. And if we don't get phase one right, phase two isn't gonna happen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stone, Dr. Stone. Um, so we will ask that you take 90 seconds now for your closing statement. You know, I'm, I'm not really connected to anybody. 
you've seen from my papers that I'm even an unaffiliated voter in this city. I'm beholden to no one except the constituents of my district. I have a very strong belief in this city. I've lived here a long time and I've seen a lot of improvements, but we are always on the edge of this renaissance that is coming, that I've been hearing about since 1980. And we're trickling into it little by little. Right now, we have a great opportunity. These folks that are applying to be on here, there's many of them along with me that would be absolutely qualified to do this job and would, and would do a great job. It depends on what's going on at the time. Right now, for our city, for our district, this 21st century plan is critically important. So I might not be the right candidate for 10 years from now, 15 years from now, but today, when the issue of schools is so critical in our city, and the working together all the branches of government, it's important to have someone on the city council who understands what children and family need and what communities need and how we can make that happen in our schools. Thanks. Thank you, sir. We, th we thank you uh, for tonight. We thank you for the work that you've been doing and are doing, uh, particularly with the uh, school and all, all young people. Thank you. I, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to go back to my board meeting. Is that all right, or do you prefer we stay? Yes. Thank you again. Uh, coming next will be Arthur McGravey, followed by Rob LePen. Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Kraft, uh, who just left the room. My name is Arthur McGreevy. I'm a resident of Locust Point, and I'm asking for your support uh, for the vacant city council position in the 11th district. In 1997, I moved to Baltimore uh, for law school. I've been here ever since. Tonight's my three-year uh, wedding anniversary. I convinced my wife, who'd never lived in the city, to move down here. Uh, we just bought a house in Locust Point. We have a four-year-old son who we're gonna raise here. I'm asking for your support because I'm excited about the progress I've seen in Baltimore over the last 15 years. I believe in this city and I wanna work hard for the people of this district uh, to make sure that Baltimore continues to move forward and doesn't take a step back. So my son sees an even better Baltimore uh, than I've experienced. This is what I think I bring to the table uh, in a city where we spend 20% of our $3 billion budget uh, on public safety. I have significant public safety experience. I was seven years a prosecutor. I was the chief lawyer for a 400 member police force. And every single day now in my law practice, I I've seen the other side. I represent uh, young men and women who feel sometimes that they haven't been treated fairly uh, by the police of this city. So I think bringing that experience is helpful. I've also worked at the local government level, uh, representing the Department of Inspections, License and Permits, Consumer Affairs, I've negotiated labor contracts with ASME, police, fire, 911, understand those issues. Uh, finally, uh, for the last six years, I've ran a very small business, small law practice uh, in this district. I think my experience inside and outside of government uh, will serve me well on the council. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Mr. Mitchell to, uh, to uh, handle this portion of the uh, question session. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Question one. What is your view on development in Baltimore? Bring this mic a little closer, please. Good evening. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role do you think the city should play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? Thank you for the question. I support both those projects. I believe in responsible development uh, when it helps raise our revenue base. Uh, when we improve our revenue base, our other problems uh, become more manageable. Currently, we spend about 6% of our budget uh, on neighborhoods. Uh, we need to improve that. We're not going to do that uh, unless we raise more revenue through responsible development, uh, through city job programs that retain jobs for our young people so they can pay taxes, uh, and for other areas. So I, I support those projects. I think that we need to put more money into neighborhoods. We're only going to be able to do that if we bring more people into the city and, and we increase our revenue stream. I'm ready for the next question. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer the communities of the 11th District 
And what do you suggest, trans how do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homeless into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homeless issue in the 11th district, especially along, along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? I, I really like this question. Uh, when I, I read this question, I, I immediately thought of uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Uh, Dr. Yunus is a Bangladeshi economist uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2006. He pioneered small uh, micro loans to impoverished people that couldn't get credit and so forth that, that, that raised thousands of Bangladeshians uh, out of poverty. Uh, the homeless issue is complex. There is a small class of, of our homeless who simply need a little help. Ideas like that, giving them small loans for cell phones, for a suit, for help with a car, things like that can bring them out. The other areas, uh, and I've worked, uh, worked at soup kitchens uh, with the homeless, you see it's mental health issues and it's, tr it's drug addiction uh, and so forth. And, and we need more money to address those things. Um, it's not going to be done overnight. We need to increase our revenue stream. Uh, well, the city needs more money. And, and once we do those, we can start putting more money uh, into mental health treatment, uh, into drug and, and alcohol abuse, which will help our homeless community. Uh, as far as uh, the neighborhood portion of the question, you know, certainly microloans aren't going to help uh, help neighborhoods, but 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 larger loans, uh, sometimes very small projects, uh, you know, improvements to businesses, uh, cleaning up of lots, helping a new restaurant come into a neighborhood can be the tipping point uh, where a neighborhood begins to transform and we can bring in uh, the type of development and businesses uh, that we want. Uh, you know, it's something that we should look at. I'm ready for the next question. Considering what you know about the 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. Sure, as I've said before, I think the number one district in this city, no matter what district you live in, is increasing our revenue stream, retaining families, getting jobs uh, for people that live in our district. All our other problems become manageable uh, with more money. And I missed the, uh, I think I missed the, uh, the second part. Oh, and the second part, I think it's schools. Uh, I think that we lose a lot of people uh, that pay taxes and work hard because they want to move out to the county for better schools. If we improve our schools, we'll retain more people, we'll have a better revenue stream, we'll be able to de do more, whether it's cleaning the harbor, mental health issues, whatever some of the, uh, the, the, the areas that receive less funding from the city are. Thank you. Okay. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them to Baltimore? Thank you. I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I, I do think there needs to be uh, much more transparency, and, and I think that we can use our incentives to, to, to eliminate risk. For instance, if there's openness uh, and transparency with developers, we can look at profits and say, look, you know, we're not going to give you these incentives to give windfall profits. But you know, if you fail, if you're not as successful, you know, there is money, there are tax incentives that, that can bridge that gap. When someone's willing to go somewhere that, that development won't go, they should receive large breaks. So I don't think we should do it uniformly. I don't think it should be used to create windfall profits. Um, but I do think it's a tool uh, that the city can use to bring business in and, and to increase our revenue stream. Thank you. Just a second, uh, Mr. McGravy and Mr. Mitchell, I'm going to ask you both to speak a little louder. Sure. Uh, apparently, we're having some trouble picking up uh, your voices uh, as it streams. So thank you. We're good. I think we're on think, question four. How do you think the city is dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? And what would you do differently? Sure. Uh, since 1999, obviously, uh, the police have, have, have done a better job. The, uh, the crime rate has gone down. Uh, the relationship uh, between the communities uh, and the police is not good. Uh, every day, I, I, I try jury trials in various jurisdictions in the city. And outside of the city, uh, when you ask jurors, you know, do you trust the police? everybody raises their hand that they do. When you ask that same question to jurors in this city, it's the complete opposite answer, and, and, and that's not good. Uh, you know, I worked uh, as a lawyer for a police force. We have these, these big codes that we give police. They're called standing operating orders. Hundreds of pages, rules for police. But really, we need a simple, simple code. You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Uh, we see, you know, every day in the paper, these police officers that get in trouble, they get indicted, or, or so forth. It, they're not really the problem. The problem is the whole other part of the department that, that knows who the bad apples are and, 
and, and does nothing. Um, we need to change that culture. You know, when you have a police officer who comes forward on his fellow officers, ends up having a rat placed on his car, that's not a good thing. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done uh, to improve that culture. I think the council president's idea of body cameras is an excellent idea. Always finish a sentence, please. Thank you. And I think Karen Krigger's ideas in her recent report were, were instructive. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system, and how would you recommend the city act upon in that factor? Thank you, and, and, and I'll be frank, I, I don't have uh, some of the experience in education that, that some of the other people that you hear from uh, today. Uh, what I did was I, I pulled out the budget and I started looking, uh, looking through it, through some of the expenditures uh, on education. That's kind of the approach I'll take on, on council issues. I, I looked at a couple expenditures. Uh, the Alternative Option Academy for Youth. We spent $172,000 on it, uh, and 80% uh, of those students are, are, are successful. We do a pretty good job at the lower grades, but we need to improve things for, for, for those students that are going into high school. So we turn them into productive members of society who pay taxes, and, and, and not individuals that, that, that burden the system. Uh, another program that we spent uh, $3 million on, the Workforce Service for Out-of-School Youth, 95% uh, uh, committed no crime. I thought that was great. I, I think if we do those things, we'll raise revenue and we'll be able to do some of the other things uh, in our education, you know, pre-K and so forth, uh, that will be instructive. It's an area, you know, if I'm on the council, I, I certainly want to learn more, um, but that's the approach you'll see from me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have 90 seconds, please, to give your closing. And, and and I'll be very brief. I, I think I'm just going to tell you how I'll, I'll approach, you know, politics and, and, and the work of a council. Uh, I've worked with some of you. I, I don't know all of you. I, I do some, have some experience with Councilman Kraft. Uh, Ten years uh, we, ago, we ran for election. I think he'd tell you that, that I, I was honest, I worked hard, uh, I listened, and I educated myself about the issues. Uh, on election night when I lost, the first thing I did was I went to his campaign party and I shook his hand. I said, thank you, uh, good luck, and let me know how I can help. Too often in this country, politics has become divisive. People see their opponents as enemies. That's not my approach. I'm going to treat people with civility. When I disagree with them, I'm going to listen to them. I think that's an important skill for a council person to have. I thank you for your time. You have a, a very difficult decision, and I wish you luck. Thank you, sir. We appreciate, yeah. as with the others, you're coming forward and putting yourself up for this particular public service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight is my wedding anniversary, and I've promised my wife I would take her to dinner. Uh, may I be excused if there's any additional follow-up? Well, sure. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. Absolutely. We thank you. Uh, next on board is uh, Rob LePen, who will be followed by Daryl Cripp. <laughs> I love you, too. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen of, uh, of the committee, I want to introduce Chris Reel, who is the president of Federal Hill Main Street, but he's actually speaking uh, on my behalf tonight uh, as a friend and as a, uh, a resident of the 11th District. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, speaking as a resident and a business owner in the 11th District. I live in South Baltimore, and I own a tour company. Uh, I am the president of Federal Hill Main Street, and I also sit on the board of the Baltimore Tourism Association. I've known Rob for many, many years now, and recently um, we became a lot closer when Rob was running for uh, Maryland House of Delegates in the 40th District, which also encompasses many parts of the 11th District. It was an incredible experience, and Rob threw himself into this venture with everything that he had. It was really amazing to see him uh, rise to the occasion, reach out to members of the community, knock on hundreds of doors, make hundreds and hundreds of phone calls, and really advocate on behalf of the people in that district. Um, in particular, his efforts on behalf of the people of Morrill Park, um, dealing with the CSX intermodal facility, brought media attention to that. Folks in Annapolis took notice, and he really made a difference for those folks. I'm very confident that if given the opportunity, Rob will represent the residents of the 11th district with the same uh, vigor and fervor that he did during that campaign for the Maryland House of Delegates. 
and uh, I'm, I'm real happy to support him. And I'd also like to point out that during that campaign, in a very, very crowded field in that 40th district, Rob was one of the only candidates to earn the endorsement of the Baltimore Sun. So that was something that we were all very proud of, and I'm proud to uh, support Rob tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So I'm back. All right, Mr. LePen, when you're ready, you can begin your opening statement, please. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Robert LePen. I am 35 years old. I live in Ridgely's Delight, which is that small community of 570 homes just next to uh, Canham Yards and in between MLK. Um, I was born and raised here in Baltimore City. Uh, I went to, uh, I actually went to school in Baltimore County though and then eventually went to high school at Mount St. Joe. I was raised by a single mom who's here tonight in the pink and uh, she basically taught me everything I needed to know in life and especially about giving out to others. And life was pretty hard growing up like it was for lots of people in Baltimore City and uh, it wasn't as hard as some and, and easier than others but um, the bottom line is we made do with what we had. And uh, she taught me what was important in life is to go ahead and help those who are around you and respect those around you, no matter who they are, their creed, their race, their religion, whatever. Um, I've always been involved in public service to include, is that in my time running out? <laughs> to include, um, I was a school teacher no. here in uh, Baltimore City. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. I um, was a volunteer fireman. I started that when I was in high school. I went from there and became a soldier in the United States Army. Uh, when I got out of the military, I wanted to continue to give back to, uh, to my community. I started a nonprofit while I was in the military that dealt with uh, helping orphans in Korea. And so when I left that, I just loved the learning thing, the process of teaching kids. And so I came back here and I became a school teacher at the Walbrook High School Complex. It was an academy that is now long gone called the uh, Homeland Security Academy. Uh, while I was there, I was given the uh, Reginald F. Lewis uh, Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award, um, and uh, I left pretty much right before the school was closed. Uh, my most recent endeavor, I was the candidate for the Maryland House of Delegates in District 40, which encompasses 50% uh, of the 11th District. Um, some of you probably already know me because I've come to your communities and spoken or, or, or whatnot, or knocked on your door asking for your vote. Um, my highlights to that, number one, I was able to successfully stop the CSX intermodal facility from, okay, well, we'll get back to CSX in a second with this next question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Palombo. Thank you. We'll uh, lead this portion of the uh, questions. Sure. Good evening. Uh, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role uh, should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? Thank you. Um, I think that question is not an either or question. Um, it's, a, it's a question about responsible development. And I think that we can all pretty much agree on that. We've seen a lot of things happen that weren't in the best interest of the, of the neighborhoods. For example, the CSX Intermotor Facility. Um, Quick background on that, CSX uh, wanted to build an intermodal facility and they needed a place to build it. After every single, single county other than Baltimore City kicked them out of their jurisdiction, they finally came to Baltimore City and wanted to build it in southwest Baltimore uh, in a small residential uh, neighborhood with about 1,200 people. It was basically a place where that, that rail facility did not need to go. Um, so here's my thing about responsible development and why I would support stepping back and thinking about what benefits everyone in the community and everyone in the city as a whole. The CSX intermodal facility is an important thing for the state of Maryland, but it's wrong to put it in the middle of a, of a neighborhood. So that's why I fought that. It wasn't because I believe the development was bad or that we didn't need an intermodal facility, but I did it because what really trumps development are the people that live in the community already. And any government has to respect the people. That's it. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer to communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness in thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issue in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under 83? The promotion of affordable housing, which is very important. Um, I have actually really just four pieces of notes, and on that, it's uh, lower property taxes, healthier schools, safer neighborhoods, and invest in small local business. And so this hits on the one, lowering property taxes. Um, we need to do something 
to make it more affordable for people in Baltimore City to live. We need to do something to make it an incentive for people to want to come and live in Baltimore City um, through tax credits for first time home buyers, credits for those who may already own a home in Baltimore City but may want to move into a larger home but still remain in Baltimore City. We need to do something to keep people here. And so I think one of the things to do to create these pockets of, of, of diversity is create affordable housing, diverse housing, planned development, use smart growth initiatives, and um, I'm going to say it again, lower the property taxes, which is the biggest thing that any city can do to invite more people to come in. And if you want to see uh, an example of that, you can look at Boston, which lowered the property taxes of their city for people that lived in the city, raised it on vacant homes. Um, and in the end, it's flourishing now. So that's another example. And as far as homelessness goes, there's a two-pronged approach to it. Most people don't understand. Uh, they think that homelessness uh, is plaguing Baltimore City, or we have homeless people in Baltimore City because there aren't enough homeless services. But really what people forget to think about is those homeless people were in some type of services that the city or the state or the federal government provided before. They were either VA or in housing or... Uh, um, uh, with food, with Medicaid, whatever. And those services at some point failed those people which made them homeless. So the first thing we have to do is fix those services. The services that keep people from being homeless and make sure they're strong and doing the right thing. The second thing we have to do is go and address the mental health issues and the addiction issues that our current homeless people have on the streets. Homelessness is not a crime, it's a disease. People don't wanna be homeless. Those that do say they like being on the street, it's because of a mental health issue, and this is what we have to address. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore and explain your response? Uh, I think we're considering what you know about the 11th district, list two issues. Sorry, did I skip that one? Sorry. Uh, considering what you know about the 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority. Um, this is going to be really my same response for the education issue, but there are so many issues that face the 11th district and Baltimore City that it's really hard to pinpoint two. So I generalized it with community development and community sustainability. And this is how I want to do this. Um, we need to go ahead and make sure that our mass transit is available to all peoples. We have to go ahead and retain small businesses and invest in our small, small businesses, including the small businesses that already exist now but are hurting. Um, we need to go ahead and make sure that our city services um, are taken care of and that when people have a problem, it's, it's addressed. The potholes, lights being burnt out, trees that are falling down, trees that they cut and take out of our sidewalks that used to be beautiful trees and they never, they never put them back. Um, and then as for the sustainability thing, um, you know, oh, sorry, green space, I have a whole list. Green space, um, bike, bike paths. There's no reason why someone should ride up Charles Street and be on a bicycle and be afraid that they're gonna be hit by a car. Nor is there any reason why the people of Bolton Hill and Mount Vernon have to move their cars to make room, or move their parked cars to make room for a bicycle path. There's a way that we can go ahead and work together to address these, these issues, to make Baltimore City a great place to live, a comfortable place to live, a safe place to live. And once again, my four things, lower property taxes, healthier schools, safer neighborhoods, and invest in small local business. Sorry about that. say those four things a lot. <laughs> now we'll get to the fourth one. Uh, do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? And please explain. Some of you may know when I was running for the House of Delegates, I was strongly against the Harbor Point project. Um, I don't believe that a government should give $107 million plus tax credits to a large developer when people in, uh, in, when our own neighbors, people that live here, us, people that own homes that pay property taxes and so on and so forth, find it difficult to live in the city. However, going back to the first question, it's one of those things, it's not really an either, uh, 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 an either or. Um, there are plenty of times where it makes, a good, it makes smart business sense to go ahead and invest in some businesses, but it doesn't make smart business sense to invest in businesses that are simply moving across the street or because they want a, a waterfront property or because they want a, a, a better view at the same time where our neighborhoods are suffering, where our schools are suffering, where we have crime, where our kids are hurting and where elderly people don't even have enough housing for themselves. And we're gonna turn around and go ahead and give millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of bond money a way to developers who are billionaires. So the answer is yes, 
but once again, responsible development and planned development. And the community should have a say, and the people in the community should be heard. And that's that. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? Um, this, is, this is a current role that I have. Um, I, uh, I um, am the co-chair of a committee in the Southwest Baltimore Partnership, which is comprised of the seven neighborhoods of Southwest Baltimore, and it's the Safe, Vibrant, Walkable Committee. And it's kind of a long name, but uh, basically, if you get to the point where you're talking about crime, in Baltimore City or crime anywhere and 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 battling crime you've missed the point altogether because everything is about the prevention of crime why do people commit crime in the first place so on and so forth the committee that I'm a co-chair of what we work on is better lighting on our streets better trees investing in our businesses investing in um, outreach programs for our youth having um, having youth, uh, uh, youth work programs during the summer. Well, we all know what happens in Baltimore City as soon as the school lets out. The kids have nothing to do. So why don't we give them something to do? Why don't we invest in our future now, or we're gonna have to invest it in the end? And we invest in the end through more policing, more incarcerations, and then people that go through a cycle of in and out, in and out, in and out of the prisons. So my basically, my point to this, I think the Baltimore City Police are doing a much better job. I agree with a lot of things, like the body cameras, all that stuff, but what we really have to focus on is what causes crime in the first place and fix that. Everything's about the source of the river. Otherwise, you're wasting, our, you're wasting money. And please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most uh, effectively improve the city's education system and how you, would uh, how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. As a former educator, and as many educators will agree, it's impossible to pinpoint one concrete thing that will magically fix education. It's impossible because our kids, our schools, our teachers, our parents, our communities face too many issues. Um, in 19, and the best way that I can describe this about how we can increase resources is by telling you like the story. In 1960, the population of Baltimore City was 300,000 people greater than it is today. And in 1960, they had 60 less schools than we have today. So the population is near a million people. We're at 600,000 now, and they had less schools, and they did a much better job at educating. I'm sure a lot of people will talk about better economy, more people live in the city, better tax base, better parents, whatever the case may be. But what it really boils down to is this. In 1960, you went to a school and in a school system that had enough resources, that had athletics, art, music programs, that had an assortment of language programs you could choose. So the kids had a plethora of different options to go to, and they got a better education. So what I'm trying to talk about now is this 21st century school plan that this is the greatest opportunity that we have to go ahead and pull in all of our resources and basically recreate the, recreate the school setting that we have. Too often, too often small community schools, these charter schools come up, and some charter schools are amazing, but some charter schools are here and gone within a year, two years, just because they can't make the grade or because the funding they promised just dried up. And in the end, those kids in those schools are once again moved to another, to another school. Well, the, so many of the kids in Baltimore City already come from a family that's always in a state of flux and, and, and change and, and, and a lot of bad things. We shouldn't also put them in a school system with flux and change and, and, and so on and so forth. So my biggest thing with the schools is we need to go ahead and use our resources appropriately. Right now we spend four, uh, what $15,497 per pupil in Baltimore City each year. That's grossly more than any other jurisdiction in the, in the state of Maryland. There's no reason why our kids aren't getting a good education. Thank you. Uh, take 90 seconds for your close, please. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm here because I believe in this job. And in fact, the reason why this is the most nervous interview I've ever had in my life is because I really believe in this job. And I know that I'm going to do a great job at this job, or at least try to. I've never, ever in my life accused myself of being the smartest guy in the room or having all the answers. And I don't. And I never will. But what I can promise everyone, and what I promised everyone when I ran for the House of Delegates, is that I'll always be me. I'll always be honest, I'll always listen to you, and I'll spend the next two years, if appointed, if, 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 if considered for this position, I'll spend the next two years making sure every single one of you have my cell phone number, the same number I've had since high school. We can make these changes on my one little sheet of notes. We can go ahead and lower our property taxes, have healthier schools, safer neighborhoods, 
we can invest in our small and local businesses. It's possible, and it's not just something we should do, it's something we have to do to remain sustainable in the future. So Baltimore City just isn't a good city because we know she's got problems and they need to be fixed. And these are four of the biggest issues that we have to fix. I can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. But together, I've seen, as a soldier fighting the CSX intermodal facility, as a teacher, I've seen what a group of people together on a common goal can achieve. And so I believe we can do anything together. And I do hope to have your support in this, uh, in this, uh, this candidacy. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your coming again with all the other candidates presenting themselves. We do have um, a number of letters of support, um, I think eight to 10, uh, for Mr. Le Pen. These, again, are in the record and before uh, the members of the committee. And so uh, they are here for us. Um, uh, Mr. Cribb uh, will come before us next, followed by uh, Gregory Cilio. I'm sorry. I have someone to speak. Sure, would you introduce her, please? Uh, this is Ms. Cindy Williams, the uh, CEO of Loving Arms, Inc. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it is my honor and pleasure to be here on tonight to give a recommendation on behalf of Mr. Daryl Cribb, who is a true trailblazer at tackling the tough issues that's facing our city. Daryl is currently an educator, and not just an educator, but a special educator. When I thought about what I needed to say about Daryl tonight, I actually had to, be, to write down all the things that he was involved in, and I was somewhat surprised at how much this man is actually already doing to address the issues within our city. He is currently serving on the board of the Baltimore Homeless Youth Initiative, a initiative of individuals that's tackling the tough issues of homelessness, especially as it relates to homelessness with children in our city and young adults. Darrell also serves as the board chair for his neighborhood association. He is a business owner of the Humanitarian where he actually does various outreach events annually. He serves over 600 homeless individuals. He is a father, he's a man of God, he is a grandfather, he's a brother, he's a friend, he's a colleague, and he's my business partner as well as my partner in life. And it gives me pleasure to ask for you to please consider him seriously as a member of the city council. And thank you. I would suggest, Mr. Crib, you quit while you're ahead. I don't think he'll do any better. <laughs> Let me that. say the benediction. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming before us. You have 90 seconds, sir, to give your opening statement. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, my name is Darrell Charles Anthony Cribb, and the reason why I have four names is because the 11th district is very big, and I need to send each name to a part of the district. Um, I, I've been a, um, a resident of the 11th district for the last 15 years. When I first came to 11th district, I was a, a recipient of the services in the 11th district. Today, as which, which was said, now I'm a deliverer of services in the 11th district. 11th district has been um, something that is very dear to the heart. Uh, when I see anyone in my community suffering, it, it really tears on me. And the reason why I live in the 11th district is because I wanted to make a difference. And I thank um, the citizens of Baltimore for allowing me to be able to represent them in the 11th district once you guys choose me. No. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bass will uh, handle the question portion of this. Good evening, Mr. Cribb. Good evening. How are you? First question. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? Uh, good question. Uh, when, when I, <laughs> I think development is great. Um, when I think of development, I think about human capital I first think about developing the citizens in the 11th district. And when I say that, I mean an educated citizen, one who votes, 
one who uh, pays taxes, and one who gives back to the community, because I don't care how many buildings that you build in the 11th District uh, State Center, what about the people around it? Are you building the people that are around it that are gonna be able to um, help support and sustain the, the centers and anything that's built in the 11th District? Okay, thank you. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? And how would you deal with the homelessness issue in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under Interstate 83? Well, I am in support of the, uh, the mayor's journey home to work with the chronically homeless and the housing first model that recently was adopted. What research has shown through these models in other states is that if we provide housing for the chronically homeless first, as opposed to uh, doing previous models where they have to be cleaned up first, the possibilities of long-term solutions to preventing future homelessness increase substantially. The other thing I would like to do is ensure that we earmark funding for programs that provide preventative services to youth and young adults that are in the early stages of homelessness so that they don't become individuals along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83. Thank you. Mm. Considering that you know about the entire 11th District, List the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. Um, lack of education and services to address the needs of the families and youth living in the 11th district. Baltimore can meet the needs of the citizens, but lack of knowledge is as deadly as a lack of resources. A top priority for me would be to identify what resources viable in the current resources that we have available in the 11th district and educating the residents in the 11th district about what we already have and then I will identify the needs and the services already provided in the 11th district by doing mapping. Every day I'm finding out about new services, mom and pop businesses and all of those who are doing great work in the 11th district but no one knows about them. I believe a lot of our resources that we need for the 11th district are all already there. We just need to tap into them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. I do when it benefits everyone that's involved. Uh, not only the business, but the, the residents in the community that they come into. Um, <laughs> Uh, I always believe in compromise. Uh, you know, in the community pack that, that they did in California, when businesses come into your neighborhood, you know, they, they should be talking to the community associations first and finding out about the community, the citizens in that community, just before they come in. And I think that that's one of the great, the great incentives that a community can have when a business comes into the community is, is, is coming together and seeing the senators for the business and seeing what the senators are for the residents of the 11th district. Okay, thank you. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? Uh, I will put more funding into our youth and preventative community-based programs. The long-term effect that can be produced through prevention I, I believe far outweighs the long-term cost that we currently and will continue to pay if we don't work with our youth and young and youth serving program. You know, I, I, I look how much it costs to house someone who gets arrested. It's, it's anywhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year. If we take that thirty, forty thousand dollars and give it to a program that can serve thirty or forty uh, uh, residents and do preventative measures. We just saved the city and state some money. Okay, thank you. Um, please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. The first thing I would do is have a mandatory school attendance until the age of 18. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 
I don't know, when I think of someone who's at the age of 16 and they can just sign themselves out of school, with, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. And also, uh, the you need 60 to pass. When did we lower our standards in education? You know, uh, Baltimore was the top, and still one of the top places to come and get your education. So why, why can't that be in our schools in the 11th district? Um, also, uh, uh, being an educator and being there, the, the families need to be more involved. The teachers need more support when it comes to schools. Uh, teaching a classroom myself, I didn't get support the first three months that I was teaching. And when I did get support, it made a big difference. I was able to concentrate on teaching my students. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crib. You now have 90 seconds to give your closing statement. Okay, um, just like to thank you for having the opportunity to come up here. Um, very nervous. Uh, anyone knows me uh, in the 11th district, uh, I give it up my all. I clean up my bank account. I, I will help anyone, any, any citizen. I, I, I love Baltimore City. Um, and I just want to end with this. Bonk Twain said, you know, the two greatest days in one person's life is the day they were born and the day they found out why. And I found out why. It's to serve the citizens of the greatest district in the city of Baltimore, the 11th district. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming forward uh, this evening and your service ongoing. Uh, Gregory Cilio, please. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman Stokes, members of the committee, my name is Greg Cilio, and I'm here today seeking to fill the 11th District Councilmatic seat. I've devoted my career to public service and have spent the majority of that service advocating on behalf of low-income residents here in Baltimore City and across Maryland. I believe um, that we already have, you've already received my resume with details of my experience in public policy, program administration, and constituent service. I'm confident in my ability to handle challenging social issues, to ensure accountability within city government, and to develop policies that both strengthen communities and promote economic development. Because of my experience as a citizen and civil servant of Baltimore City, I can see clearly the relationship between the city's social ills, such as poverty and homelessness and crime, our economic health, and what it will take to grow this city. I know what it will take to be an effective advocate for business, institutions, communities, and individuals. As the president of the Locust Point Community Association, I've also witnessed firsthand the impact that strong community can have on the quality of life of residents. I believe that that experience will make me an effective advocate for the 11th District to facilitate dialogues between neighbors and various public and private stakeholders. My experience is not limited to any one neighborhood. I feel that I'm uniquely qualified to represent a diverse group of communities that can be found in the 11th District. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. LaPointe. Good evening. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. harbor development and state center, versus development in neighborhoods and communities, and what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? As was said earlier, and I agree, the issues of large development versus community development is not an either or, it's an and. As president of the Locust Point Community Association, I've learned what it is that is essential with all development or other change that community have input. I believe that it's the role of the councilman to facilitate a dialogue between community and other stakeholders. I know that I have the skill set to find the intersection of interests. I won't just ensure that those conversations occur, I will be a part of them. The growth and economic development of the city are top priorities. I recently met with Reverend Hathaway from Union Baptist, and we discussed the transformative potential of the State Center site to drive economic development in the West and Central Baltimore while ensuring that we don't lose critical state jobs. At the same time, we need to continue to invest in Main Street programs and our commercial corridors to ensure that we have the types of retail that support residential growth. I believe in grocery stores, not just corner stores. 
As councilman, I'll advocate on behalf of transitional neighborhoods in the district to ensure that businesses and developers invest in communities bringing jobs uh, that with access to healthy food and quality goods. Anchor institutions like our hospitals and universities are driving forces of economic development in the 11th district. The councilman needs to work with these institutions and further promote the growth while ensuring that community's voice is heard. Thank you. Thank you. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving, mixed income communities. How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th District, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? I come to you today with over 12 years of experience studying and working to address the issues, the issues of poverty and homelessness, both academically and professionally. I've personally spoken to hundreds of panhandlers. I spent countless hours assessing the needs of poverty-stricken neighborhoods. I understand the cycles of poverty and violence that plague communities throughout the city. I see poverty as a systemic issue that requires a holistic approach. The city cannot do this work alone. Public and private partnerships have to be consistently and strategically mobilized to address it. I believe that the city can, should work with partners to create organized pipeline of opportunities for education, job training, and financial literacy. Homelessness and panhandling in particular are complex issues, as others have noted earlier, with no easy answers. Encampments require interagency efforts that address true safety and health concerns while connecting individuals to housing with comprehensive services and not just criminalizing homelessness. We should follow other counties' models and develop a campaign to encourage citizens to give a hand up rather than a hand out. To encourage it to, to choose uh, to give to the journey home, uh, the, the city's initiative around homelessness, rather than directly to panhandlers. The reality is that our city as a whole can never reach its full potential unless these persistent pockets of poverty and homelessness are resolved. Concerning what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. As I've lived and worked throughout this district, I've learned that every community is unique and that it has its own set of priorities and issues. Uh, these issues are all so diverse that it's challenging for me to, to kind of succinctly answer this question all at once. For example, Locust Point and Federal Hill have been debating angled parking for years. Seton Hill is begging for it. Mount Vernon appreciates density, but other neighborhoods cringe at the idea of another development project. Despite this, I believe that there are two universal uh, issues that impact communities across the city, public safety and education. Both are incredibly important to the uh, stability and growth of our neighborhoods. They're also the two biggest factors in determining whether families choose to stay and invest in the city or move to surrounding counties. Our residents deserve streets that are walkable. Our tourists should come to Baltimore without hesitation or fear of crime. No matter what the neighborhood, families should feel confident in sending their children to their local public school. These issues cannot be fixed overnight, but the strength of our neighborhoods and the growth of our city are dependent on their progress. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. I do believe that financial incentives are one tool, one tool, that can be effective in attracting investments to our city. I believe that when we use this tool, it needs to follow careful thought and calculation with the long-term health of our economic health of our city as the primary concern. Given our disproportionate tax rate compared to surrounding jurisdictions, Baltimore's being property, property tax rate being only twice that of other jurisdictions, it is often difficult to develop large-scale projects without some form of tax incentive. While tax increment financing and payment in lieu of, of taxes are the most common in incentives, uh, there has been some recent targeted tax credits that have shown great promise in providing a boost to economic development in Baltimore. The targeted 15-year ta conversion tax credit to help converting languishing commercial buildings into thriving residential buildings is clearly working. The citywide 10-year tax credit that follows is pushing projects forward that have been dormant for years. The recent conversion of office buildings downtown and elsewhere are showing great promise. 
The downtown business di district now represents the fastest growing census tract with a diverse group of people choosing to live there. The end result is that we have more economic development activity than before and we're doing it without existing city revenue. While I think that these tools are sometimes necessary, I will never take the use of them lightly. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? With regard to the relationship between communities and the police department, uh, I'd say it's not good enough. As chair of safety issues for Locust Point, uh, I've experienced with acting as a liaison with the police department and representing the interests of my community. I've helped to organize citizens on patrol walks and made a priority to walk the granted safe streets of Locust Point. During my time working for the city, I was given the opportunity to go on a police ride along in the Southern District. I saw firsthand the challenges facing our police officers. I've seen both the strengths and the weaknesses of the policeman's community approach to policing. As councilman, I'll ask the commissioner to consider adding more community relations officers to ensure that every community a meeting and COP walk has a reliable officer on hand. I'll also ask to ensure uh, that issues discussed at meetings and on walks are tracked and that the community has confidence that their concerns are being addressed adequately. I'll also request that the commissioner provide additional customer service training and sensitivity training to officers and we'll have a zero tolerance policy against abusive behavior. The proposed body cameras could go a long way in that. I recently met with Delegate Hammond of the 46 and we discussed the concept, concept of stabilization centers or sobering centers, which would be a place where police can bring people who are intoxicated to sober up and get them connected to services. This prevents officers from spending countless hours in hospitals and in central booking and puts them back on the street where they are needed the most. I think it is this sort of innovative thinking that will make, have, have the most impact on the limited public resources we have for public safety. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. I believe that the primary factor in improving our schools is the need to redefine what it means to educate a 21st century child. The traditional 8.30 to 2.30 school day is no longer adequate. The school system needs to take a more holistic approach that, that produces students who are job ready and college ready. Full funding for our educational institutions is also critical to the success of our young people. As you know, the city doesn't control the school system directly. That means that the city council must find creative ways to take a more active role in the governance of the school system. One immediate opportunity is the council to work to maximize the 3,000 square feet of community space that is required as part of the 21st century facility initiative. There's great potential to engage local businesses and community associations to adopt these spaces and partner in instituting mentoring programs. I've spoken extensively with Terry Hickey, executive director of Big Brothers Big Sisters, regarding the critical need to expand mentoring programs targeting vulnerable youth. A 21st century education also means that out of school and summer school need to be seen as opportunities to further enrich children's learning and provide them with valuable opportunities that will prepare them for the future. YouthWorks has proven, has proven results, and as councilman, I would be an ambassador for YouthWorks across the 11th district. The councilman also is uniquely positioned to facilitate enhanced relationships with the recreation centers in the schools. The Rec to Tech program at Digital Harbor is a prime example of what can be accomplished uh, when we're fostering innovation, tech advancement, and entrepreneurship by helping young people develop skills in a digital age. Great. Thank you, Mr. Salio. You now may have 90 seconds to, uh, for your closing uh, statement. Thank you. I can think of no greater honor and privilege to represent the district that I call home and a job that encompasses my passion and commitment for public service. Uh, with your vote today, I hope you'll select the person that understands the big picture. The person that understands the diversity in the, of the communities in the 11th district. The person that has the experience in public policy and a proven track record of constituent service. The person that is dedicated to promoting economic development. I hope that I've shown you today, uh, this evening, uh, that I am that person. I believe that Baltimore City is a great city with even greater potential. I would like to play a part in ensuring that we reach that potential. I truly hope that you'll provide me with that opportunity.
Thank you. Thank you, sir, for coming forward. Uh, we do have some 2025 uh, letters of support uh, for your candidacy here tonight. Again, the committee has these letters. It's on the record, and we thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have reached the halfway uh, point in the candidates. In just a moment, I will declare a five-minute recess. Uh, respectfully, I ask that the committee members uh, not speak to each other or the public on the matter before us. Uh, so we will now take a five minute and also ask the public not to speak to the committee members on the matter before us. Uh, we will now take a five minute recess. Thank you, everyone. We will uh, now reconvene uh, the committee hearing, beginning with William Romani, followed by John Kutzker. Mr. Romani. You're on, I think. I think you're on. I brought uh, Donya Johnson with me to speak. And your staff here? recommended that she not drink the water out of the water fountain and brought her back somewhere to get her something okay. to drink. <laughs> Did she leave permanently or she's on a break? No, no, no. No, no. She went with your staff to go somewhere else that there's good okay, water, apparently. Okay, she can speak when she comes. Okay. No problem. Why don't we begin, and uh, at, uh, right before your closing, um, she can welcome to come forward and speak. Um, so uh, you may begin with your 90-second opening comments, please. Thank you, my name is Bill Romani and I'm applying to be the next councilman in the 11th district. I'm a physical therapist and a teacher and for over 16 years I've worked with neighbors in South Baltimore and throughout the 11th district to improve schools, expand access to health care for the uninsured and drive economic development. For the last three years I've directed AARP Experience Corps in 30 Baltimore City Title I schools including Furman Templeton and Lockerman Bundy. Our 350 volunteers, many of whom walk to the schools that they serve, average an age of about 68 years old, and teach 7,800 pre-K through third grade children to be ready to learn at kindergarten, to read at grade level, and to attend school consistently. Since 2006, I've sat on the board of the nonprofit vacant house receiver one house at a time, and I've watched them become a catalyst for emerging neighborhoods by auctioning off and getting hundreds of vacant properties renovated and back on the tax rolls. And as the Vice President of Federal Hill Main Street, I led our efforts to create a peer-to-peer micro-lending program to provide capital to our small businesses that were struggling through the recession. I mentioned that I'm a physical therapist. In 2003, I founded the nonprofit Mamma Jam Music Festival to support breast cancer screening and treatment for over 280 uninsured low-income women a year at Harbor Hospital and Mercy Medical Center. I believe the breadth of my experience and the diversity of the communities that I've worked with provides me with a unique and valuable perspective that I'll need to represent families and businesses in all of the neighborhoods of the 11th District. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Simmons will conduct the questions uh, portion of the interview. Good evening, Dr. Romani. Good evening. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially with regard to large development, such as Harbor Development and State Center, 
versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? There are currently $2.5 billion in development projects in the 11th district, by far the most in the city. And in order to keep our city growing, we need to support and promote responsible development projects that create a win-win for the developers and the surrounding communities. Those wins include jobs, walkable neighborhoods, and long desired amenities like a grocery store in Bolton Hill and a bakery in South Baltimore. Development that enhances our quality of life, complements the character of our historic neighborhoods, and includes constructive community input. The city agencies lay the ground rules for development through the zoning code, plan unit developments, and land use, and they're in a position to assess and determine whether the appropriate infrastructure exists through processes like traffic or parking studies, and should act as a vehicle to gather and ensure public input and testimony through hearings, or as we are in the midst of now in South Baltimore with the new casino public planning meetings. The councilman can play a very important role to help the developers and community work together through these processes. I think that my background and focus in the communities that I live and work in will enable me to look at development projects through a community lens, but with an eye on finding ways to make those projects a win-win. Now, I, I should also point out that despite the wording of the question that not all development projects are neighborhoods versus developers, right? For example, the state center complex is actually supported by the community and the neighborhood alliance and the versus that is holding the project up is actually big developer versus big developer. My goal as the councilman will be to facilitate an environment where neighborhoods work with developers to create the win-win projects that we need for our city to grow responsibly. Thank you. <clears throat> the city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district, how do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issue in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? Well, no matter what neighborhoods they live in, our neighbors all want the same things for their family. They want a, a job, good schools, safe streets with open space. And if we're going to transform our emerging neighborhoods, we need to leverage the city's resources in a systematic and coordinated approach to maximize the impacts of our effort. One of the most important efforts will be to create stable, affordable housing. There are an estimated 16,000 vacant houses in Baltimore, and as many of you know, those vacant houses, when scattered throughout a block, attract crime, reduce public safety, and drive down property values. Since 2011, the city's Vacants to Value program has used code enforcement and the receivership process to get vacant nuisance properties renovated and back on the tax rolls. And since 2006, one house at a time that acts as the city's receiver, and I've seen firsthand how many of the 730 vacant houses that we've auctioned off have helped to jumpstart neighborhoods by providing that stable, affordable housing. Baltimore also has about 3,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given day, and it's a complex problem that awful, all, often involves a crisis in food, health care, and safety. And all too often, homelessness impacts intact families, and especially children. Existing programs like Journey Home and Health Care for the Homeless show how we can make homelessness rare and brief through advocacy and by providing affordable housing, comprehensive health care, employment, and emergency preventative services. To truly address homelessness, we need to make jobs and affordable housing our priority in the city. And if we do that, the benefits won't just include reducing homelessness, they'll also help include the transformation of those emerging communities that need that jumpstart to thrive. Thank you. Considering what you know about the 11th District, list the two issues that are top priorities in your estimation? Yeah, the, the issues that our neighbors are struggling with and talk to me about all the time really aren't that surprising. We've heard a lot of them tonight. Crime, the drug trade and public safety, public transportation, good schools, and of course, parking in Federal Hill, historic preservation in Mount Vernon and historic Marble Square, effective transportation planning in South Baltimore and Bolton Hill, and vacancy rates in the conversion of B-grade office space to residential units downtown. But the two themes that I keep hearing over and over again 
is that our government services need to be more responsive and accessible to the community, and that we need to manage and effectively prepare for the potentially transformational development projects already underway in the 11th district. People want to know that their government works, that their bills and their assessments are correct, that when they make a call, there'll be effective follow-up, and that when there is a large project or repair, that there'll be adequate study and planning, and there'll be an opportunity for public input. As our councilman, the process will start with me by being visible in the community and by continuing to provide prompt, courteous constituent services that provide residents in all of our neighborhoods with the city services that they need. And finally, as the district is in the midst of $2.5 billion of development, we still have a lot of work left to do to make sure that the infrastructure in and around those projects will continue to support and even complement the surrounding communities. For instance, that means a complete streets plan around the new casino and a transportation plan for state center that doesn't cut off the access from the surrounding neighborhoods, but instead encourages foot traffic and walkability. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. Yeah, financial incentives like TIFs and pilots along with a new program to facilitate the conversion of office space to apartment units are potentially effective ways to cre create jobs and promote the growth of our city. But we need to be careful to use those incentives with the goal of creating good projects that are a win-win for the developer, the city, and our neighborhoods. As a councilman, I'll be supportive of development projects that provide this win-win not just for out-of-town developers, but for those right here in Baltimore with a proven track record of success. Many of these incentive programs provide opportunities to provide a significant win for the city and surrounding neighborhoods, like hiring a majority of city residents, as we've just seen with the Horseshoe Casino. That said, Financial incentives for businesses and development aren't exclusive to billion dollar projects. Provisions in the recently passed tax breaks for rental units also include breaks for significant improvements to vacant and abandoned houses as well. A tool that could be used to help address the need for affordable housing in some of our emerging neighborhoods. And finally, whereas tax incentives are a tool to alleviate the tax burden on certain types or areas of development, they do not alleviate the need for the city to work tirelessly to reduce the tax rate citywide, pr providing a potentially transformative incentive to spur further business development without the need for the tax breaks. We need to maximize our opportunities to make sure that as our city and its taxpayers are investing to make sure developers get a good return on their investment, that the return on the taxpayer investment also extends to the neighborhoods who need it. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship <clears throat> between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? Well, after a troubling increase in crime in 2013, murders in Baltimore are down 6%, shootings are down 16%, robberies down 15%, and overall crime is down 9%. We appreciate, first and foremost, those officers who serve us every day and that are working hard to keep us safe. That said, the police department still faces challenges with trust in several communities and a feeling that some officers may not always be working with us, a feeling that's been exacerbated by recently documented cases of police brutality. Now to remedy this, the department and the city need to take steps to improve the relationship between their officers and the communities they serve through continued increase in training, engagement, and transparency. Commissioner Batt's comprehensive plan to cut down on police brutality is a start, but it's pretty clear that there's an emergent problem right now that can begin to be addressed today. First, we need to better utilize the Civilian Police Review Board process to investigate complaints regarding abusive language, harassment, and excessive force. Next, we need to ramp up the recommended pilot for uniform cameras on officers which have drastically reduced officers' use of force in complaints against police in other cities. And finally, as Donya said at a community police public safety meeting last winter, by the time the police are involved with a young person who has committed a crime, it's too late. We can lose sight of the fact that our most we can't lose sight of the fact that our most effective long-term crime fighting strategy is prevention. 
That includes programs like the Violence Prevention Strategy at the University of Maryland Shock Trauma, and making sure that our children are staying in school, have productive out-of-school time programming and jobs as an alternative to getting caught up in crime and involved with police in the first place. Thank you. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system, and how would you recommend the city act upon that factor? Well, we're in the midst of some very exciting times for Baltimore City Schools. We have a new CEO and the biggest investment in new and renovated school buildings in history. And whereas a welcoming, safe environment to learn and outstanding teachers and principals are vital for our children's success, statistics show that the most important factor getting a child to stay in school, graduate on time, and get a productive job is to be reading at grade level by third grade. A 2010 report by the Casey Foundation showed that to read at grade level by third grade, students needed to be ready to learn by kindergarten, to attend school consistently, and to have quality out of school time and summer learning experiences. And as the branch director of AARP Experience Corps, I've had a front row seat in 30 Title I city schools to see just how effective that strategy can be. We've worked with the Baltimore Student Attendance Collaborative to engage students at risk for chronic absence and their parents to decrease chronic absenteeism by almost 20%. Since November, we've teamed with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's ORCIDS program at Lockerman Bundy to provide after school and summer literacy training that accelerates our students' achievement. Our students deserve a cutting edge curriculum to go with the 21st century schools that we're going to be building them over the next 10 years. Organizations like Experience Corps, the Family League, and Promise Heights are showing that investing in the early grades is one of the most important investments that our city can make to most effectively improve our education system. And the city has a mechanism to do that now through the Family League in Baltimore and by, um, by supporting those out-of-school time programs. Thank you. Um, has your uh, referral come in yet? She has. She has. Would you invite her up, please? Donya, I would like to invite you to come up and speak on my behalf. This is Donya Johnson. <laughs> hey there. Hi. Um, sorry, I feel really short back here behind this podium. Sorry. Um, hello. Smile, guys. It's OK. My name is Donya Johnson, and I am an activist here in Baltimore and a senior at Seton Keough High School. <clears throat> I will start by asking you, what is the narrative you want to tell? Is it one of success and unity or one of separation and failure? If you're going with anything less than the best, then anyone will do. Sorry. If you're going with success, however, I must warn you that the candidate is in the room. Bill Romani is an amazing man and an even stronger uniter of people. Recently, the narrative on the national and local level have been one of us versus them. The city versus the people, the police versus black youth, and big development versus the community. But if I have learned anything about stories, is that you define the ending is that you determine whether or not we will take a step to make our city stronger or to leave it as is. I believe that Bill, in partnership with you guys, can make this a story of connectedness, a story of unity, a story of building an amazing city. Now, I hand you this hypothetical pen and give you the task of writing the rest of this story. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Romani. I might subscribe to your earlier advice, uh, Mr. Chair, and punt, because I probably won't top that, but I do have a closing statement. <laughs> <laughs> Still, you can take 90 seconds to give closing Thank you. comments. The 11th District is one of the most diverse districts in Baltimore, a diversity that ranges from quiet avenues in Locust Point to bustling shopping districts along Pennsylvania Avenue and state-of-the-art mixed-use developments downtown. A diversity between longtime and native residents of Baltimore and our new neighbors who are just discovering the jewel that we know Baltimore is and how awesome potential that she has. But standing in the way of that potential are crime, vacant houses, and neighbors looking for jobs that act as nagging reminders of the work that we still have left to do. 
As your councilman, my priority will be to create balanced communities where retail, entertainment, retail and entertainment establishments complement the surrounding neighborhoods, safer neighborhoods with the strength to grow so that the prosperity in the waterfront communities doesn't just stay in the waterfront but carries over to help create safer, greener streets in Upton and Sharp Leadenhall. Prosperity that helps ensure that everyone has the fundamental opportunity to have an affordable place to live and quality health care. Because when all of our neighbors and neighborhoods get stronger, our city gets stronger. And it's because of that diversity in our district and its amazing potential that the conversations and developments that shape the 11th district also go a long way towards shaping the direction of our city. I want to be the next councilman in the 11th district because I want to represent its people, businesses, and neighborhoods and help them find solutions to the most pressing problems that they face every day. And in doing so, I want to make a positive impact on the important conversations that we're going to responsibly shape the growth of our neighborhoods and our downtown. I think that my experience throughout the district and my passion for our city will serve me well and place me in the best position to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Romani. Again, with, as with many others, we thank you, uh, not just for this evening, but for the service uh, that you give to this city every day uh, currently. Uh, we appreciate it. We have some 30 letters of support uh, for Mr. Romani. Again, uh, to be repetitive, it is uh, a part of our file and in front of all the members of this committee. We will now ask John Kutzgar uh, to come forward, followed by Julie K. Dunham Howell. Howie. Good evening. I'd like to invite Alicia Wilson to speak on my behalf. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good evening. My name is Alicia Wilson. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Gordon Feinblatt, and it is my honor and pleasure to introduce John Kuskar to you. I've known John for over little, almost a decade, and I met John when I was a third year law student, and John was a first year. And I can tell you that as a first year law student, he was special. He was an exceptional individual that was able to connect with the diverse student body that is found at the University of Maryland School of Law. And there were three notable things that I recognized about John immediately. As a student bar leader, I always looked to see who could I join on my team. And John was an individual that I would, without hesitation, have joined my team. Because one, he always showed up. Two, he always performed. And three, he always produced. And as an attorney, it has been my pleasure to watch him do those three things in his service to the state and to the city, that he's always showing up, that he's always performing, and that he's always producing. And I think that the, city, the residents of the 11th District would be blessed to have him as a city councilman. And that you as city council members would be blessed to have him as your colleague because he would be known as someone that always showed up, that performed to the best of his ability and produced the best results for residents of his district, but also the entire city. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, thank you. <laughs> so thank you, you'll have 90 seconds still uh, to give the opening comments. Bring the mic, thank you. Uh, Chairman Stokes, members of the committee, Council President Young, members of the City Council, uh, my name is John Kuskar and I would like to thank Alicia uh, for her kind words. Um, and I'd also like to thank the 35 residents, business owners, and uh, employees of the 11th District who wrote letters on by my behalf. They're, they're from seven different neighborhoods and downtown, so I think that shows that I have a, a broad coalition of folks uh, who support me. Um, we need our next council person to understand the diverse and complicated needs of this district and have the ability to deliver results. Uh, I know this district because I've been all over it and I can deliver um, because I have the right experience in government to get things done. I also have the right priorities and the right perspective um, that we need in city government. I've lived, worked, and served all over this district. I've spent the past five years living in Bolton Hill, but previously I lived for two years in Federal Hill. I spent a year living near the university, and I also spent over a year in Pigtown, which is just outside the 11th, but faces many of the same di issues like vacant housing and a struggling Main Street commercial district that face communities in our district like Upton. And I've worked downtown and taken leadership roles in many of these communities. 
So for almost the past decade, this district, all of it, has been my home. In addition, in, throughout my career in federal and state government, uh, I've learned how government operates, what motivates government employees to act, and how to get things done in a government setting. I've used my skills as a lawyer to evaluate when there's a true legal barrier or when folks are hiding behind the law as an excuse to not take action. And I know when an issue requires public criticism or when a private meeting would get the same thing done and not publicly embarrass somebody or some department. Um, my ability to understand the mechanics of government would be a huge asset uh, and in addition to my community involvement uh, to solving constituent concerns and providing informed oversight of the executive branch. Thank you. Um, Mr. Freeman will um, handle this portion of the questions. Good evening. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, such as Harbor Development, State Center, versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? This is absolutely not an either-or choice. Regarding development, the answer is that both large and small developments create jobs, so I'll support both. On large projects, I strongly support State Center. Uh, one leader in Upton told me this will have a transformative effect just like Harbor East did uh, for the neighborhoods in that area. Uh, I will strongly support building the Red Line, which will be a huge transformational opportunity in our communities. I'll support revamping the Inner Harbor, whether it's through the 2.0 plan or some variation and bringing new, innovative 21st century jobs to our central business district. But of course, it's not just big development projects. We need to support neighborhood businesses. I have experience with the city's main street programs and have given sufficient support. I know they can help grow our small and local businesses. Strong neighborhood businesses and nonprofits also create jobs and they create walkable, sustainable neighborhoods. Uh, in addition, in our district in particular, we must preserve our neighborhood's historic character. From Upton to Federal Hill, Mount Vernon to Seton Hill, Madison Park to Bolton Hill, and South Baltimore to Marble Hill, we have intensely historic neighborhoods, and we need to protect them, as that character entices folks to come to Baltimore and stay in these communities. And we can't let historic properties like Clarence Mitchell's office or Thurgood Marshall's house uh, fall into disrepair. Those should be monuments to our heritage and deserve protection. So ultimately, I don't think we need to pit downtown against our neighborhoods. Uh, as the 11th District Council person, I will represent both and find win-win solutions that will grow our city and our district. Thank you. Thank you. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th District? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed-income communities? How would you deal with homelessness issues in the 11th District, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83, uh, sorry. <laughs> so one way to address poverty and homelessness is to get people jobs. For those that are job ready, we need to help them find work and pay them a living wage. For those that are not quite job ready, who don't have those basic skills, we need to provide training for those basic skills to raise them up to a level where they can hold a job. Uh, currently, I serve on the board of the Baltimore Integration Partnership, or BIP, which is a collaborative effort to expand economic opportunity to low-income residents and communities. It's kind of the economic inclusion model. Uh, and our current focus is on anchor institutions, increasing local hiring and com community investment. So for example, along MLK, uh, the anchor is the University of Maryland, and we much, must leverage their resources to solve the problems that are in their backyard. But as we know, jobs alone won't solve homelessness. We should incre increase supportive housing, or the housing first approach. As you've heard tonight, this is the approach where tenants pay an affordable amount and get both a roof over their head and services in their uh, building, like mental health and addiction counseling. And we need more of this. And in some neighborhoods, the Vacants to Value program will transform an empty city block uh, to a productive city block. Based on my experience as chair of the trustees at Old Otterbein United Methodist Church, I know we can collaborate better with the faith-based communities uh, to address these needs as well. And, and more importantly, on a broader scale, we can't forget or let others forget that the 11th District has a multitude of needs. I think it's easy for outsiders in particular to look at the 11th and think that we're a relatively wealthy district. Um, and we may be on a broad scale, but as most of us in this room know, uh, we do have those neighborhoods that needs, uh, you know, with poverty and homelessness concerns that we can't just ignore. And for someone like me who lives in the northern part of the district who needs to take MLK or needs to take 83 to get almost anywhere, uh, it's impossible for me to forget these issues because I drive past them every day. OK, 
Considering what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. So on specific policies, it's creating and retaining jobs, improving our schools, and improving public safety. But from a broader perspective, there's two focuses. The first is that I'll fight for family-friendly government policies. Crime in schools are huge issues, of course, but as a member of the board for the Downtown Baltimore Family Alliance, and more importantly as a dad, uh, I know we need to do it more on other issues too. I'll push for increased pedestrian and bicycle safety measures so that parents who are pushing strollers and kids who are riding bikes aren't scared about traffic speeding through the neighborhoods. Second, I will advocate for increased funding for parks and recreational opportunities. Along those lines, I recently spoke with a parent who after much deliberation sent her child to public school, which is what we all want, right? Our kids go into public school. Um, and she said the school is actually much better than she expected, but the after school, which is run by uh, Rec and Parks, is terrible, and that that was the reason why she was thinking of leaving. And then we must fix that. And finally, we need paid family leave for city employees. Uh, some ask how we can afford it, but I ask how we cannot afford to do it. Paid family leave will provide the city more qualified, happier, and better employees. It will show families, and particularly mothers, uh, that Baltimore welcomes them, and it's the right thing to do. Um, and second, uh, kind of on a broad level, is making sure the city delivers its core services. This is how people trust government or learn to distrust government. Um, and as we've heard tonight, different neighborhoods have different needs, whether it's zoning, parking, senior housing, potholes, sanitation. And I, along with the staff, would be responsive to every individual concern while looking to community leaders on broader neighborhood concerns. Uh, I would also borrow an old idea from a former councilman and restart the, week, the councilman on the corner uh, kind of issue on a, on a weekly basis so I can hear directly from residents and so they know they can find me somewhere in the district on a corner every week. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them to Baltimore? And please explain your response. So we need to strongly question business or development projects under two circumstances, ones that trigger neighborhood concerns or that request taxpayer funding. Uh, I'll ask those tough questions to ensure taxpayers are getting a fair bargain if approving a TIF or a pilot or another tax break. And I'll ask these questions at the beginning of the process, not at the end when facing a final yes or no vote. Uh, I would also urge that on large projects, the city council asks for an independent estimate of the project's economic impact to find out how much taxpayer funding is actually needed. Uh, because when funding is involved we, involved, we do have limited resources and then we do need to balance the benefits of development uh, when giving away money against the balances of more rec centers, more police officers, or more neighborhood grants. Uh, but in some cases, I think certainly taxpayer funding is warranted. We need more city jobs for more city residents, and bringing those jobs to Baltimore often has far-reaching benefits far beyond the cost. Previous large development and job-creating projects like the Inner Harbor, Camden Yards, and most recently Under Armour's uh, expansion set the stage for the Baltimore we know and love today. Uh, when the long-term benefits outweigh the long-term costs, I will support moderate financial incentives for the next generation of investments that bring more jobs and new growth to Baltimore. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? And what would you do differently? I think overall we need to give credit where credit's due. So I think par part one crime is down across our district. Police leadership is generally connecting better with our communities. Recently I heard a leader in the central district talk at length at a community meeting about building positive relationships with community members and treating people with respect. Um, and so I support that push towards even greater community policing. Um, but of course there's more we can do and what would I do differently? I'd, I'd say three things. The first is I would immediately co-sponsor the body camera legislation. Uh, it protects our residents. It protects our police officers who do the right thing and play by the rules, and it will avoid confusion and animosity like that in Ferguson and like that in Baltimore City with incidents we've had in the recent past. Second, I would propose that residents see in real time how crimes against them are being followed up upon. Often people report crimes and they never know what happens. And so, uh, you know, I propose a secure online system to ensure that victims and maybe even community leaders or community residents can track cases throughout the system in real time. And third, we must solidify the process how police communicate with residents in the direct aftermath of a crime. Each neighborhood or each group of neighborhoods may have different preferred communications, whether it's Facebook or a listserv uh, you know, or a website, and that's okay. Uh, but residents need to know where and when they can expect to find accurate, timely, BPD-sponsored information. I know many community leaders in this room uh, have worked hard on this issue, especially in recent weeks and recent months. I would join them to work on that issue with the police department. 
please state what you feel to be one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system, and how would you recommend the city act upon that factor? As of course everyone knows, it's virtually impossible to pick just one factor, but I would actually agree uh, with Dr. Stone that the new school construction funding provides a once in a generation opportunity to build schools that will help hundreds of thousands of Baltimore children uh, learn better. They'll learn better in state of the art, safer, cleaner buildings. Um, but in addition, school buildings will be that catalyst for community change. Um, they'll be the anchors and in turn a successful community school, a successful anchor will increase community buy-in it will increase community volunteers, that will increase parental involvement, it will increase the positive neighborhood energy in our students' lives, and that stronger support system will ultimately result in a better education. Um, but because this opportunity is so big, uh, we have to get it right. Um, the stadium authority has their role, the school board ha has their role, but certainly city government's role uh, is to make sure that community voices are heard during the project. Uh, so folks in the community know which gaps an anchor school could fill best. They know that best, and they, they, uh, we need to make sure their voices are heard. Um, and so we need them to be stakeholders. If, if a big building is just plopped in the middle without stakeholder input, in the middle of a neighborhood without neighborhood input, it's not going to become that anchor. And just be, A, because the needs may not be met, but also because when folks don't feel invested in a project, they kind of naturally push it away. And so uh, in many ways, just for the process, we need to get the neighborhood folks uh, neighborhood leaders and neighborhood uh, parents involved uh, to improve, uh, to make sure this is done right. Thank you. Uh, will you now take your 90 seconds to give closing comments? Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, and before closing, I just want to make clear that if I am appointed to this position, I will resign immediately from my current job and fo focus exclusively on meeting the needs of the 11th District. Throughout my career in government service and neighborhood service, I've learned and I've believed deep down that government, smart government decisions have the huge ability to make positive change in our lives. We need government officials who can address both the short-term crises and the long-term systematic challenges. And we need elected officials who understand that if government doesn't work, uh, we're gonna lose the support of our constituents, we're gonna lose the trust of our constituents, uh, so we need government to deliver results and I have the skills and the community background to deliver results in our district. Uh, I'll also bring a fresh perspective and new voice to city government. Uh, I'm not entrenched or, uh, you know, in outdated thoughts or stale ideas or the same old way of doing things. I'll be a fair, independent, progressive voice uh, and a democratic voice on these issues that matter to 11th district residents and businesses. I'm open to supporting any good idea and willing to work with anyone to make sure that Baltimore is better for everyone. And ultimately, I want to serve to be your councilman and your councilman um, to, to help the city fulfill its potential as a vibrant, sustainable, prosperous community where my wife, my three-year-old daughter and I, and families all across the city can live happily uh, for our entire lives. So I hope to have that opportunity, and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. Uh, Mr. Kutzgar, we also have about 30, 35 letters of support. Uh, before the committee and in our file. We thank you, thank you. Uh, for coming. Uh, the chair uh, neglected earlier to ask if uh, any of the candidates attended Loyola Blakefield High School, because we get in this early. Okay, we, we got to keep going. <laughs> I know we have a gale here, but they, <laughs> they don't count. <laughs> Teasing, of course. Um, Thank you. I want to mention uh, before we uh, go on and uh, that uh, the Democratic nominee from the uh, House of Delegates, 40th District, Antonio Hayes, has joined us this evening. And also I see uh, the Mayor's Chief of Staff, Calliope Potamus, is also here. Good evening. Uh, so our next two uh, candidates are Ms. Julie K. Dunham Howie, who will be followed by Eric T. Costello. Thank you, and it's Jules. Julie's on my license, but everyone knows me as Jules. People are like, is that you? It is me, Jules. Actually, you know, um, well, that's okay. I was gonna say, in, in the uh, information we receive, we have both spellings, but it's Jules, huh? Very good, Jules. Got yeah. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it gives me great pleasure to ask a delegate of the 40th Legislative District, Barbara Robinson, to come forward and speak at this time. Good evening, City Council members, uh, President, 
Nominating Committee. It is indeed an in, uh, honor and a pleasure for me to stand before you to support Jules Donham. I've known Jules for uh, almost 20 years now. And uh, again, my name is Barbara Robinson and I represent the 40th Legislative District. I just won my third term and Jules worked shoulder, sh to sh shoulder to shoulder with me in order to win. And the 11th Councilmatic District takes up about 50% of the 40th Legislative District. So why am I supporting Jules? Because I've knocked on hundreds of doors in, those, in that district running for my third term. And I've attended a number of community, uh, committee meetings and I understand what's needed there. And I have worked with Jules and she understands economic development. She understands workforce development. She also understands how to work with people who, have, who are intellectually challenged and physically challenged which results in some of the homeless people that we have now. So do I know that she can do the work? Absolutely. Do I stand behind her and support her? Absolutely. I've seen her work in fundraising. I've seen her work in organization development. And as a minister, she provides service to people who need help. And that is what it takes in order to serve in any district service. You are providing service to your constituents. Now I started to write something down so that I would not miss anything that I wanted to say about Jules. But when you've worked with someone as long as I've worked with her and when you've seen the type of work that she has done and I know the type of work that I do and having to work with her from a state representative working with the city and that's what it takes. It takes somebody who's able to think out of the box to get things done and it takes someone, take someone who can work across racial lines to get things done and I thank you. Thank you, Delegate. We appreciate you. Frank? Yes, I'm sorry. You'll take your 90 <laughs> seconds with your opening comments. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Councilman Stokes, Councilman Kraft, and to the committee. My name is Jules Dunham Howie, and I would like to thank the City Council for this opportunity to participate in this important process. I live and worship in Upton's Marble Hill community, and I have a home and office in Bolton Hill. I have a grassroots community organizing background, and I cut my teeth working to mobilize participation in world conferences around youth policy issues. In 1994, I mobilized 10,000 youth from all around the world to participate in the United Nations International Conference on Population and Development in Istanbul, Turkey. This was one of the first world conferences where a youth policy statement was recognized and read into the record on the General Assembly floor much hard work. I have a BS degree from James Madison University and a Master of Divinity degree from Payne Theological Seminary. I've lived in the 11th District for 18 years and I'm the owner of a consultancy firm and over the last 14 years I have worked to strengthen the infrastructure and operations of community organizations in all parts of Baltimore City. And I, I consider it an honor and a privilege to work with the people in Baltimore. I believe my, my extensive work in with communities has equipped and prepared me to continue the vital work begun by former Councilman Bill Cole in the 11th District. Ms. Dunham, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city plan working with neighborhoods versus large developers? The Inner Harbor development was the first initiative of redevelopment of the downtown waterfront over 30 years ago. And I believe that it's been quite successful in generating new revenue streams that support the city. It has also been an engine for tourism and provided new employment opportunities and tax revenues for the city. 
I see the harbor and waterfront as key assets for the city's growth and development, and it is important for the city to leverage our waterfront property to support more downtown and uptown development opportunities, such as Harbor, harbor Point and State Center. As to large-scale development projects versus development in neighborhoods and communities, I think that it's imperative that you have both in the city because both have the potential to be city revenue generators. The challenge, and there often is a challenge, the challenge is to ensure that the community and neighborhoods are viable partners in the development process. People want to be engaged. They don't want to feel like you are doing something to them or for them, but rather they are part of a process that seeks their input, respects their input, and acts based upon a set of mutually agreed upon terms supporting holistic development. The goal is to ensure that when development is complete, the community remains whole and is not displaced or disenfranchised through the development process, but it's revitalized. That's my definition of smart development. This, this question also speaks to the critical issue of growing and developing viable small businesses. Small businesses, I believe, are the lifeline of community, and they help attract new homeowners, increase property sales tax revenue, and I actually believe they stabilize community. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Howie, when you, uh, back to you, Howie. Would you bring the mic down a little, please? Down. Closer <laughs> to your yes, mouth. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Second question, the city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? I greatly appreciate this question. I believe that you transform pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities by engaging residents in depressed community and offering the supports and technical assistance resources that they need to stabilize their homes. If they are still living in their community and it's depressed, I believe it's because they want to stay in their community, but often they don't have the supports that they need in order to revitalize their own homes, much less help the community. You have to adopt a no harm agenda that seeks to build up community assets while strengthening the most vulnerable resource that we have in the community, which is our people. The, res the renaissance of Baltimore is slowly being ushered in, and I can see us achieving the goal of growing the city by 10,000 families in 10 years. Yet all we, know, all we have to know is that this growth and development is going to be hard work, and it's going to require the city to address the tough societal issues that plague our communities, such as homelessness. Baltimore City has a plan to end homelessness called Journey Home. And in June, it announced the housing of over 1,000 homeless individuals through the program. Baltimore actually is housing 4% of its chronically homeless population each month, which is better than the 2.5% goal. And there have been national best practices identified, and there's a four-step success plan that needs to be maintained to address homelessness. First, we have to identify homeless neighbors by name, maintain the dignity of the person. And then you have to build a file about them. Why are they homeless? And my colleagues have talked about all of the issues. You have to prioritize the most vulnerable homeless neighbors, and then you have to find permanent housing for them. And perhaps that's our MLK and I-83 neighbors. You have to adopt the housing first approach, which offers permanent housing with wrap around community services. And ultimately, you have to track how well are we doing with the problem. Considering what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. The 11th district is vast, as everyone has said. It includes 16 critical communities and stakeholder groups. And looking at the income disparities within the 11th district, it could be characterized as the land of the haves and the have-nots. 
I like to think of, um, uh, of it perhaps as the land with the best restaurants and the most food deserts, the land with the most expensive property and the cheapest property. And, and, and therefore, we are, to me, a community ripe for exponential growth and development. But how do we do it? Two critical challenges have to be addressed, neighborhood revitalization and economic development. When we think about neighborhood revitalization, the mayor extended the Baltimore City uh, anchor plan, which is BCAP, which to me is a great plan because it's an action plan to foster growth and development in our neighborhoods. And it in now includes uh, anchors such as Maryland Institute College of Art and the University of Baltimore in the 11th District. And they're looking at how can these anchors actually go forth and work in partnership with the city and partnership with the community to actually address the critical issues of home ownership incentives, neighborhood revitalization, recreational assets, public works, and transportation capital investments in business and employment services. And I think that you have to figure out who are your, where are your infrastructure components that can help the work happen. And so when you bring together these entities in authentic partnership, you can begin to see some great sparks of growth and development, which really gets you to economic development. How do we attract businesses to the 11th district that will grow the city's economy while strengthening the communities they're a part of? While we have to begin to figure out how do we cre create opportunities for job placement within our economic development processes. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. As long as there is job creation and it is a win-win, I support providing financial incentives to businesses and developers. We need public-private partnerships that benefit the city, the developer, and the community. Specifically, partnerships that provide job creation and have first source hiring of Baltimore City residents. City and development partnerships that provide much needed revenue streams for the city, including piggyback taxes, income taxes, personal property taxes, and real estate taxes. The city, I, I believe, should explore and have the debate about creative financing mechanisms such as tax incremental financing and payment in lieu of taxes. These are economic development tools that help to stimulate, stimulate jobs and revenue. Ultimately, economic development spurs job creation and home ownership. And it actually can help us attract the 10,000 families that we want to bring to the city. But there's a ripple effect when you do this work well. It affects our local college graduates who are looking for internships and job placement opportunities. They can get them right here in the city. The ripple effect, uh, it, it touches university professors and instructors who are looking for new models for how do you engage um, the business sector and bring them into the classroom. It affects existing businesses, providing them the opportunity to provide goods and services to large corporations and in turn help them grow and hire more people. And lastly, the ripple effect helps attract other large businesses to come to Baltimore City because success breeds success. You know, if I were a Keynesian economist, I would call this the multiplier effect, but I'm not. So it's really about optimal growth in a community. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? Well, when you look at crime out of context, it looks horrendous. But when you look at it in context, the fact that we're just coming out of a great recession, the unemployment rate, low educational attainment rate, and lack of market-based skills in the workforce, you see that crime is a cause and not an effect. If you address the root drivers, then you can see a decrease in crime. I believe the police department actually is doing a good job with the resources that they have. Yet, I do think that there's a major perception issue with law, en law enforcement in the community. The police are seen as adversaries in some communities instead of as advocates. 
Recently, or yesterday as a matter of fact, City Council President Young and uh, Councilman Branch introduced legislation about uh, requiring Baltimore police to wear digital audio and video recording devices to capture their interactions with the public. This could be a very helpful tool in changing the perception of the police in the community and increasing transparency in officer-citizen interactions. Yet, I think it warrants a pilot phase to measure its effectiveness and see how the uptake is here in Baltimore. One of Police Commissioner Anthony Batt's initiatives has been to have police officers patrol on foot more in the neighborhoods, which helps them to be viewed as people and not intruders. I would encourage more initiatives like that. In the Marble Hill community, we had a police athletic league, PAL Center. And it was at Utah Marshburn School. And back in the day, there was a police substation at the Druid Hill Y, ensuring presence and forging relationship. These vehicles engaged police in the community beyond law enforcement. They had a positive role in the community, and they fostered real community relationships. Lastly, I would say that sometimes we need to do a better job with prevention. I'll leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> Please state what you feel to be the one factor that can most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. The 11th district has 11 schools and Baltimore City has the oldest bank of schools in the, in the, in the state. Some of our school buildings, as you may know, are over 90 years old. Because our state has agreed to implement the Common Core curriculum with the Department of Education, we're required, required to administer park assessments. And, and, and that means that these assessments have to be taken online. These digital assessments require wireless access in schools, which, as you can imagine, is a challenge with an old infrastructure. How can we compete? How can we be competitive? How can we even show that we're actually attaining Common Core standards if we don't have the technology available in the schools to be able to effectively administer the assessments? The city, as you all have heard, working in tandem with Baltimore City Delegation in Annapolis, celebrated the Maryland General Assembly's passage of the Baltimore City Public Schools Construction and Revitalization Act of 2013. It's touted as the most significant legislation achievement for the city of Baltimore in modern history. But we got to get it right. The bill creates a partnership between Baltimore City, the state of Maryland, and the city schools that will actually generate significant funding for our construction and restoration. But I believe that it's not enough. We have to continue to seek more infrastructure and facility improvement resources for our schools now. This strategy will actually allow us to be able to support the school system in doing the vital work they do by providing an optimal physical learning environment. Additionally, facility dollars could also help improve school safety because schools will now be able to deploy new visitor entry systems and digital cameras. How many of you gone to a school, rang the buzzer, and they just let you in? Great. Thank you, Ms. Howard. We appreciate Can you give us a 90 seconds closing uh, statement, please? Indeed. Again, I want to thank you the committee and the city council for the opportunity to participate in the process. I agree with the first person who came up to speak about the process. I believe it's been a good process, a process that's been open, a process that's been transparent, a process that has allowed participation, and I'm grateful. I see community as an innovative ecosystem. An ecosystem is a system of interconnecting and interacting parts, which to me means that it's a place that, that, that shares its resources, and actually it's a place that is dependent upon sharing its resources. We are a district that fosters an, a, a culture of collaboration and innovation and refuses to get caught up in turf issues, I believe. We can become that. <laughs> and how do we do that? We have, to first, we have to first envision the 11th district as a district that seeds, cultivates, and nourishes. 
We seed new ideas and innovation. We cultivate new partnership. Uh, we grow deep relationship and we build authentic community. And we nourish economic development and community development leading to optimal growth. I envision an 11th district that is thriving in all communities with better schools, safe streets, and stronger neighborhoods. I believe in the people who I live with in the 11th, and I welcome the opportunity to serve. Thank you, Ms. Howie. We appreciate that um, great presentation. We appreciate you for coming this night. Our next two the candidates are Eric T. Costello and Harry F. Preston V. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased and honored to have Pastor Alvin Gwynn of the Leadenhall Baptist Church speak on my behalf. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. As stated, I am Pastor Alvin Gwynn, Jr. of the historic Latin Hall Baptist Church, and also a retired detective sergeant of the Baltimore City Police Department for 23 years, and so it is a challenge to do this in 90 seconds. Nonetheless, I'm here because I've known Eric Costello for the past three years, and in that time, we have worked together to damage, or uh, repair damaged relationships that have existed between our two neighborhoods that have historically existed between Sharp Leaden Hall and Federal Hill, and he's worked towards that challenge, and we have a better relationship as a result of his efforts. Sitting as the vice chair of the Local Development Committee, I've watched Eric apply his acumen in terms of dealing with budgetary details, and I've watched him work as he's balanced priorities, not just with the neighborhoods of Federal Hill, but in all the neighborhoods that surround the peninsula so that all neighborhoods benefit from the development that is taking place with regards to the Horseshoe Casino. <clears throat> I believe he's dedicated to not allowing any neighborhood to fall behind, and that dedication has been seen as he has taken an active interest in the Stadium Square project, which is a planned $250 million development in the Sharp Leaden Hall community. I believe that it is with the same level of tenacity that he has approached working with us that he will take two other projects such as State Center, the Red Line, as well as the Harbor Point projects, and I believe that he will be able to apply his acumen towards that job, and I thank you for this opportunity to present to you, and I also solicit my prayers for you as you continue through this process into your deliberations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Pastor. We appreciate it. Mr. Costello, when you're ready, you may give us your 90 seconds. Move this down, the pastor's a bit taller than I. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Kraft, and uh, members of the uh, nominating committee. My name's Eric Costello, and I want to uh, describe what uniquely qualifies me to be the next city council member for Baltimore City's 11th district. I currently serve as president of the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association uh, in that capacity or as vice president for the past three years, having built that organization from the ground up from a fledgling group of about 15 people coming to meetings to over 400 paid members that are very involved in the organization. In addition, I'm a member of the Merrill Appointed Local Development Committee, uh, which Pastor Gwynn just discussed, uh, working with neighborhoods uh, such as Cherry Hill, Westport, Ridgely's Delight, Pigtown. I'm the elected vice chair of the advisory board to the parking authority uh, and represent the fourth of five citywide districts in that capacity a co-founder of the Federal Hill Thinking Green Tree effort, and an active member of the advisory board to Digital Harbor High School. Professionally, I'm an IT auditor with the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Our job is to ensure that federal agencies are spending taxpayer funds effectively and efficiently and in compliance with the law. During my eight years at the Government Accountability Office, uh, my work has directly resulted in $274 million in taxpayer savings as a result of nearly 350 issued recommendations to federal agencies on how to improve the way that they operate. In such budget restrictive times that we live in now, I think we can all agree on one thing, and that is that the city of Baltimore needs to take a similar approach to how it manages its government. I do have a strong interest in City Council Bill 12-0053, 
the quadrennial performance audits bill. I'd like to see legislation evolve to help strengthen it, which will result in creating agency efficiencies and strengthen and expand the set of services provided to our citizens in Baltimore. Increasing the frequency of audits, how the audits are triggered, whether by mandate of the council, request of the mayor or the city council, and expanding the scope of agencies included are all ways to strengthen it. Thank you. Mr. Little will uh, guide us through the next portion of the program. Uh, uh, question one, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, i.e. Harbor Development and State Center versus development in, the, in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? Thanks. I believe the city should play an active role in working with both neighborhoods and large and small developments as they all play a role in the revitalization of the city. Uh, I believe that the council, me council members position uh, plays a huge role in facilitating the discussions that are occurring between developers, city agencies, uh, and neighborhoods. So State Center is a, a great example for discussion. It's a proposed mixed use development, which will include approximately 1,400 uh, mixed income housing units, as well as office, retail, civic, and green space. Uh, unfortunately, it's been held up in litigation for the past few years. Uh, the neighbors in that area are hungry for development, especially smart development that's transit oriented. It's right near two light rail stops. Um, and I think uh, this is an opportunity of a lifetime for the surrounding neighborhoods. And, uh, as councilman, I would not stand by and let that opportunity um, slide away. It's an opportunity that needs to be taken advantage of to support those surrounding neighborhoods. Um, I think the council member will play a vital role in working with BDC to finalize details of a TIF. Uh, and with the passing of City Council Bill 12-0159, uh, the local hire law uh, that was sponsored by Council President Young, uh, and other members of the council, uh, it could create hundreds of jobs, especially in the 11th district. Um, I also want to talk about neighborhood markets such as Cross Street and the Avenue. Uh, we're all familiar with the revamp underway at Broadway and Councilman Crafts District, uh, as well as um, plans for Lexington Market. But I think it's important that we don't forget about those smaller markets that are very vital to the neighborhoods that surround them uh, over on Penn Ave and in Federal Hill. Uh, this is an opportunity for the council member to work very closely with Baltimore Public Markets Corporation, B BDC, uh, the mayor's uh, deputy mayor for economic development, um, and to speed up the process of these projects while ensuring that the plans work for the surrounding communities, because that's what's most important here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with homelessness issues in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? So I was raised in a family where I was taught the only time you look down on someone is when you're helping them up. I'm extremely concerned about the situation over on MLK and uh, underneath 83. It pains me to see people living in these conditions, whether it's groups of lean-tos or barrel fires in the middle of winter time. No Baltimorean should have to suffer through that. However, on the other side of the issue are the concerns of the adjacent neighborhoods and those residents. Those folks want to and have every single right to feel safe in their own neighborhood. They want to enjoy the urban landscape without the meanlessness of homeless encampments that are nearby. So the root of this issue, in my opinion, is an umbrella of common social conditions which cause poverty in most major cities in the US. We've heard many of those discussed uh, this evening. They include substance abuse addiction. Uh, they include mental illness. They include veterans coming home who weren't cared for adequately. In order to solve the problem, we need to start working on these social conditions by identifying the gap in social services provided currently, and devising a more cost affordable way to deliver these services. In the meantime, as we start to address those underlying social conditions, which are very long-term problems that we have to try and tackle, we need to identify and provide clean and safe emergency housing to get these folks off the street. As councilman, I will work closely with 
and help coordinate interagency efforts among the following departments, housing and community development, health, DPW, planning, and the police to address this issue both short and long term. One thing I've learned is that shifting a problem to someone else's backyard doesn't fix it, and this problem is no different. Thank you. Considering what you know about the 11th district, list two issues that are top priority in your estimation. So that's a really challenging question. There's about a dozen issues that deserve all of our uh, attention and discussion tonight. Number one is public safety and related quality of life issues. Nothing is more important than feeling safe. Our city is never going to reach its full potential until parents can feel comfortable having their children walk home from school with their friends and not worry about them. Now, while crime is down, according to recent ComStat data, I believe week 38, uh, it's a bit down from where we were at at this time in 2013. There's still much more we can do to create safer neighborhoods. And I wanna talk about some of those tangible solutions uh, that I think should be up for discussion when we get to question five, uh, the public safety piece. But I wanna create a narrative for everyone. Wouldn't it be great if when something bad happens, you could pick up your cell phone, you could call 911, a polite and courteous officer would respond and be there in minutes to help you? What if you were to go outside, walk down the street, pick up a newspaper, a candy bar, and see the local beat officer? You knew each other on a first name basis and you guys were able to strike up a conversation. It might sound like a pipe dream, it might, but we all need to believe that we can get there one day. I believe that a dedicated council member can work with the police and the public and making this closer to a reality. Number two would be economic development balanced appropriately with community interests. We need to ensure that the downtown business district, which is the economic engine running our city, is fueled and healthy. One way to do that is to reduce the percentage of vacant office space in downtown, which was mentioned earlier. Just as importantly, we need to ensure that smart development is occurring throughout the entire district transit-oriented development where possible, and that it has a positive impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. We need to continue to address gaps in the affordable quality housing stock so that young families to seniors can find an affordable and most importantly safe place to lay their heads each night. A great example of um, this type of development is what's going on in Sharp Wedding Hall with Stadium Square, which is working out because of dialogue that's occurring between the community and the developer. Thank you. Do, you. do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. I do, but in a calculated manner. Um, first and foremost, the city's economic development priorities must be taken into consideration as recommended by the task force on Baltimore City public-private development financing efforts uh, dating back to late 2011, which Chairman Stokes was a member of. Uh, there were a number of recommendations in there, but I think the, the most important recommendation is prioritizing uh, development goals and opportunities. While tax increment financing or TIFs districts and payment in lieu of taxes pilots aren't initiated by the council, rather by BDC, the council does play an instrumental role in ensuring these public financing instruments further promote healthy and effective economic development opportunities for the district and our city. We also have to be thinking about ways that BDC can transfer benefits of large public subsidized developments to the outer parts of the district and the city. One possible way to do this is to further subsidize the Charm City Circulator to extend service. Now, TIFs and pilots are just two instruments in a much larger toolbox at our disposal. Also available are instruments with which smaller scale developments can take advantage of, such as enterprise zones, property tax credits, employment tax credits. These tax credits are financial incentives which are accessible to small entrepreneurs that want to renovate a single building or start a new business in Baltimore City. It is equally important that we have financial incentives that promote startups and entrepreneurship which helps develop and strengthen communities. One area we could focus on this immediately is with the emerging tech center in Baltimore. That said, I think we need to be judicious in how we use these instruments as we attract new development and small business to our city, as each and every economic development situation presents its own unique challenges and its own unique opportunities. Thank you. 
How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? I'm not sure if anyone has heard of the legislation introduced by Council President Young and Councilman Branch last evening, uh, but that's a great start. It would mandate officers wearing personal mini cameras while they're on duty. Uh, it provide an opportunity not only to protect our citizens, but to also protect the officers that we entrust to keep us safe every day. Uh, I definitely have an interest in further exploring ways to protect the critical relationship between citizens and officers, as this is really my belief that this is the key to beating crime and creating a safer city. First, public safety substations. Explore the creation of public safety, including both police and medic substations, in high crime areas to ensure a strong police presence which deters crime. This will require close collaboration between the community, police, and council member. This is one thing that I've been working on with reps from the local development council and Councilman Reisinger uh, to create a new substation in close proximity to the casino. Additional cameras, and uh, number two, additional cameras and fiber backbone. Explore the installation of an expanded fiber optic network to provide additional HD cameras connected to CityWatch, which eventually should also promote further business development and growth in the 11th. Hopefully a kill two birds with one stone. Number three, police and community relations councils. We need to raise awareness of the two councils, the central and the southern, throughout the district. These meetings provide a great opportunity for citizens to interact with those from other neighborhoods to discuss common strategies for getting more public involvement in solving crime. In addition to the cop walks, there are other things that could be promoted to get the community more involved. And fourth, the civilian review board. We should increase the visibility of this permanent statutory agency tasked with processing and investigating complaints regarding abusive language, harassment, and excessive force by the police. Thank you. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could mostly effectively, most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would rec recommend the city to act upon the factor. I think Mr. Stone and Mr. Kuskar hit the nail on the head here. Uh, I believe the most important factor is the 21st century uh, school buildings construction effort. Uh, while the plan is primarily funded at the state level, uh, it is a partnership between the state and the city and Baltimore City Public Schools and the Stadium Authority. Um, so the city does play an important role in the oversight of these reconstruction efforts and how that plan is implemented. Uh, this program will bring new or renovated schools to students across the city by creating a physical infrastructure that promotes the use of technology and ensures safety and security. Integrating schools further into the surrounding neighborhoods is a community resource. Creating a healthy environment for learning with good air quality, lighting, heating, and ventilation, and safe water to drink. I've developed very strong relationships with Principal Brian Iyer at Digital Harbor High School and Principal Sarah Long at Federal Hill Prep. My goal is to develop those same relationships with principals from each of the remaining nine schools in the 11th district, of which eight are slated for reconstruction in the next one to nine years, or renovations, pardon me. I'd like to help organize community forums to get the schools and communities together, to find new ways for communities to engage in the schools and be a part of the school. It is also important to meet with parents, students, teachers, staffs, and administrators at each school. In closing, I would welcome the opportunity to be a strong advocate for and fight for funding to support public schools that are stronger in Baltimore City. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, your 90 seconds, please, to uh, give your closing comments. I believe my professional background in auditing and IT and extensive experience as a community leader and volunteer will translate very well to the skill set required of our next city council member. As an auditor, we are trained to look at problems and issues in a very analytical manner. We're required to be objective, fair, and balanced. If we lose that, we've lost our ability to solve problems with an open mind. The opportunity to serve the 11th district would be truly humbling. If that is the case, I plan to resign from my current job, as well as all other community boards, so I may focus every waking moment on serving the people of the 11th district. This will be my only job. I'll welcome the phone calls at 2 a.m. on a weeknight about a water main break in Locust Point. It will be my pleasure taking walks with the residents in historic Marble Hill. 
The opportunity to work with business owners on Penn Ave and on Charles Street to help create a more vibrant Main Street is exciting. And collaborating with the Downtown Partnership and Waterfront Partnership to advance their goals to create a safe, vibrant, and successful downtown business district in Inner Harbor is something I am not only 100% committed to, but truly looking forward to. I have the energy and stamina and am uniquely positioned to roll up my sleeves and get right to work for the 11th district. One day, God willing, when I'm 80 years old and I'm sitting on a stoop in Baltimore with my wife, I'm gonna look back on this opportunity to serve. And if I didn't go for it now, it would be truly the greatest regret of my entire lifetime. I hope that you will trust and honor me with this position of awesome public responsibility. I promise you that I will make you proud. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your service also. I will mention that we received some 25 or so letters in support of Mr. Costello. Uh, I must also mention that we received uh, an equal number of uh, opposition. Thank you. Um, Mr. Preston, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. I'm going to call uh, Josh Michael up to speak on behalf. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Michael. I'm a resident of Baltimore and a public school teacher. I've been teaching for five years. Um, I'm excited to introduce my friend and colleague to you. He's an innovative leader. He's a teacher. His name's Harry Preston. Uh, Harry came to our city five years ago um, as an engineering teacher. And with a background in business, he brought a lot of creativity, and he transformed the CTE program at Edmondson Westside. He did it through transformational par partnerships in his classroom, partnering with parents, engaging with uh, families and students, and he's been recognized in just a short time, uh, in five years, um, locally and nationally as a top engineering teacher, um, leading his students to really transformational learning opportunities. But the thing is, Harry's a great teacher because of his visionary leadership. He brings people together. He brings together business, nonprofit, and public partners. And I want you to expect that Harry's going to bring the same approach in supporting thoughtful development in District 11. Harry's home is located in Marble Hill. This is a dolphin and division. He sees daily the challenges, both the challenges, the greatest challenges in District 11, as well as the greatest opportunities for development you know, just down the street from where State Center hopefully will be. I'm proud to call Harry a friend, and I'm excited to introduce you to him to you um, as a transformational leader, and he's poised to serve uh, District 11. Here's Harry. Thank you for your introduction. I want to mention that Councilman William Pete Welch of the 9th Council District has joined us this evening. Thank you, sir. Mr. Preston, you can begin um, your 90 seconds when you're ready. Good evening, community. Uh, my name is Harry Preston V, and I want your nomination uh, for the District 11 seat. Again, I am an engineering teacher at Edmondson Westside High School. While at Edmondson, I developed a nationally recognized program that takes students of all abilities and pushes them to their highest levels. As we've developed this program, myself and the students, they have created a classroom environment that where working hard is the standard, where innovation and creativity are cherished. Our students have raised the level of expectation for all of our students in the school, not just the students in the engineering classes. Diversity of thought has become our busy, biggest strength. Now, I see this reflected daily uh, in living in District 11. Much like my school in its various classrooms, we, as a district, are comprised of many different neighborhoods. We individually represent the diversity that is Baltimore. To that end, I must stress, though we are many neighborhoods, we are one community. We are one district. Our strength, again, is in our diversity. Again, as a teacher and parent, I prioritize and place great value on investment in our communities and our schools. As a former business owner, I recognize that business plays an integral role in our growth and our development. As a councilman, I promise to be unbiased, impartial, and innovative public servant. I am invested in the growth of our entire community, 
as one district, and I ask that you invest in us by nominating me to our council. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. We'll uh, hand Thank take you. this portion of the, portion of the uh, program. Mr. Preston, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, for example, harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? As many of my colleagues alluded uh, to the point that, again, we have to realize that growth in the business and growth in neighborhoods are not mutually exclusive. We have to look at ways that we can align the community needs and the business needs, but again, respecting the individual uh, realities that exist in each neighborhood, not just specific regions, but the entire district and all the neighbors that, that, it may, that are made up by it. We need to be looking at mixed use and sustainable design, looking at low density and mixed income housing, respecting the history of the neighborhoods while meeting the needs for growth. So again, that's gonna require the use of both growth in neighborhoods and businesses. The, the bringing of programs um, like the State Center and Harbor Point, again, is bringing value dollars. We're not just bringing business. There have to be people to support these businesses. There have to be people to support these programs, and those people need places to live. And we need to make sure that we are creating a community, one community, that supports all those needs. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and business and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th district, especially along Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? I want everyone to take a moment and imagine going up MLK, turning left on Pennsylvania, then turning right on Dolphin Street. And if you look to your right, you're gonna see McCullough Homes. And if you look to the left, you're gonna see, well, you were gonna see a grouping of houses that were abandoned, dilapidated, falling apart. But imagine that somebody takes a chance on one of those houses in that dilapidated set of buildings renovates it and puts everything they can to make sure it's the best that they can be inside of that neighborhood. I was the person to take that chance. I moved into a house that, again, stood alone on its street. Now, we see every single unit in that block being filled or renovated. We meet, I've met with the people who are working on that and we have discussed going and helping to build out the existing the other existing properties, the other properties falling apart, the other pieces of the neighborhood, so that we can bring other like minded people into the neighborhood. But again, it's a larger issue. Poverty is not going away, homelessness is not going away until we are able to start providing opportunities opportunities for growth, opportunities for education, opportunities for jobs, opportunities for the entire district. We need to look at finding and identifying strategic and successful practices for attracting new families, like the one that brought me to Upton. We need to be looking at stronger pathways to ownership in our community, in our district. If we cannot own in the districts in which we live, what benefit do we have to make sure that we succeed? Where is the incentive to give everything we have, mind, body, and soul, to make sure that we grow together? Thank you. Considering what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. Uh, I cannot stress enough the biggest issue facing our district. We do not act as a cohesive unit. We don't. We act as the candidates from this district, the or this region, this neighborhood, that neighborhood, special interest groups. We all have our individual goals and aspirations, and that's good, that's fine, but at some point we have to find the way, the common thread, to come together and affect change. Now, there's a lot of overarching issues that we're gonna have to face. Again, safety being one of the big ones, but what we have to do is come up with a plan that we can do it cohesively. We need to find ways that get everybody from Locust Point to Marble Hill to Midtown to Fed Hill, all of these points have got to find one way to address this issue. Now, of course, there are going to be many different tactics to approach it. But what we've got to do 
is come together and find that solution and find that process by which we can attack it. Thank you. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain your response. Well, one thing you can count on is for me to ensure the needs of the entire community, that their needs are at the forefront of every conversation. Uh, as a teacher, I've seen a multitude of programs proclaim uh, that they're the best for all children. However, the most beneficial, the most successful programs took into account the needs of each student before prescribing a cure to the academic difficulties. Now, that is a way of saying that we can't just say, oh, we're going to offer this program or we're going to offer that. What we're going to have to do is find out what works best for each situation. There are times when strategic incentives can help us bring opportunities through business to meet the needs of every member of our community, not just the business owners and not just the owners, but every member. I have students interning at a locally run business, and, and by local at the time it was uh, Baltimore County. Currently, they're working at a bit, this business is moving into Uptown to give these students opportunities to use their skills that they've learned, to use the real world, use in real world practices, everything that they've been working so hard for. And that's the opportunity we're looking at. Those are different types of incentives. Those are opportunities to take maybe a financial but really, it's an opportunity, a chance to do something different. So again, we have to look at different ways we can do that. These kind of collaborations of mutually beneficial programs should be and need to be an important part of our community's growth. If we're going to build a community that works together with business and residents, we've got to find ways to push these types of programs. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department, what would you do differently? I will start with a, a little bit different way of a story, a different version of a story. Uh, when I first moved into my home, within four, within the first month, I was stopped by the police officers four times. Now, I'm going to chalk that up, honestly, to the fact that we did not have a relationship. Those officers did not know me. And they were very vigilant, trying to make sure that the members of that, society, that community were safe. We need to, as a community, realize that police officers are not some foreign occupying force. They are community members. They live here. They work here. They are as much a force in our community. They are much a stakeholder in our success as you or I. We need to find ways and continue to invest in programs that cultivate a level of mutual understanding and a sense of community with our police officers. Again, I've seen as a, as a coach, uh, police officers make great strides in making sure that we follow that adage, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. They are making sure that their first interaction with our youth and the first interaction with a lot of our community members are positive ones, showing that they can release their hostilities and release their, their tension through athletic means, through academic means, through business means, but by all means, work as, success, um, as members of the community. These interactions, again, cultivated district-wide, cultivated district will begin to build bridges between our police officers and our community members. Because remember, as one community, as one district, our police officers have as much to hold, as much stake in our success as we did. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system, and how would you recommend the city act upon that factor? Uh, to be honest with you, to, to, to be honest for it with you, uh, uh, as a teacher in a classroom in a city school, I can assure you that new buildings will be wonderful. Uh, to have a classroom that the lights all work and there's no holes in the wall and there's air conditioning is going to be an amazing thing. But uh, to, that's a, a plan for the future. That is a plan for growth, and I appreciate that. But what we need are programs that help students now. We have children in school today. We must prioritize and in investing in pathways for success and college career uh, ready um, programs that don't just help our students, but help our community members as well. We have community programs and schools that are poised to do these things every day. 
Uh, these investments shouldn't start in high school, shouldn't start post high school, shouldn't start in college. They need to start day one for every student, for all our families. I've been working with the University of Maryland, Wells Fargo, Bon Secure, uh, and, and a myriad of other organizations within the city to develop a pipeline for members of our community and health careers. Uh, again, working with Dr. Perman of uh, University of Maryland and Annie Bertamini of uh, Wells Fargo, we've been able to build programming that holds promise for our children, an opportunity for students to lead from pre-K to and through college, an opportunity for them to not just learn about health careers, but teach about what's available and what's possible to their families, their family members, and other community members, something that permeates through the entire community. In addition, we must focus on relevant STEM programs that meet the future needs of our society. My students are currently working on projects with Lockheed Martin, Red Line, uh, RK and K, Whiting Turn Turner, and as well as MIT. These programs all directly impact our district. Our students are going to be, go out, be able to go out and make a difference globally. And they're going to bring that global knowledge back home to our district. Thank you. Thank you. We will ask you to give your 90 second closing comments, please. Uh, there's an old saying that I, I, I stick to and I, I think especially hits home here. A rising tide floats all boats. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Baltimore's tide is rising. District 11's tide is rising. But we're not going to be able to benefit from this rising tide until we have all stakeholders who are weighed down by old bias and low investment, low education, and fear until we're able to take those weights away from them, the, the, the limiting factors. We've got to come together to pull those community members ashore and be that safe harbor. We cannot stop, we cannot rest, we cannot give up until all of our members are able to float equally. No one can do it alone. We can't do it as a neighborhood, we can't do it as an association, we have to do it as a district. We've got to take a holistic approach to issues of crime because a problem in Fed Hill or Marble Hill or Midtown may have stemmed from a housing issue at Digital Harbor, over by Digital Harbor, or an education issue. It is one district. We are all interconnected. Again, I want to reiterate, we represent many neighborhoods with a rich and diverse background, and we should never forget that. However, to move forward, we need to capitalize on the strength in our diversity and work as one community, as one district. Uh, to achieve this again, there are many options. I believe there's only one biased choice, unbiased choice. Please help me, help us, help the district build bridges between the Baltimore we are and the Baltimore we could be. My name is Harry Preston V, and I want to, your nomination for city council. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. Um, okay, good. Um, a final two. Thank you all for persevering. Um, certainly, uh, the two who are about to come before us, uh, Benjamin Smith, as far as, well, as it turned out that the last was first, it seems the first will be last uh, in the Cambridge. But, uh, well, Mr. Smith. I certainly hope you all believe in saving the best for last. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the council for being here, and I'd also like to thank the members of the committee for sticking it out so late, uh, the members of the audience as well, uh, particularly uh, the group back here on the left. Um, they're my friends and classmates here to support me. Uh, and the man standing right there, Cliff Glover, is here to provide my testimony. Great. Thank you. Good night, committee. Good evening. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for your time. My name is Clifford Glover. I am a resident of Baltimore, and I uh, work and uh, go to school in the 11th District as a uh, law student, third-year law student at the University of Maryland. Uh, and Ben's leadership, dedication, and community present, presence makes him a perfect candidate. Uh, for the vacant position. Ben's warm demeanor and southern charm set him apart from many of my other classmates when I first met him. This charm is not to be fooled with, however. 
Ben now sits as a student bar association president, and he has been an unwavering voice for his fellow classmates, even if his stances proved an unpopular thorn in the side of administration. Ben is able to effectively yet judici judiciously explain the needs of those he represents. Examples include working with the law school's administration and faculty to increase job and internship opportunities for his peers and increasing proactive dialogue between students and the law school's administration by gaining student advisory boards for key administrative departments. Through his leadership attributes and dedication, Ben has led the way in ensuring that his fellow students have a positive impact on the surrounding community and on the education of our future leaders. Examples of his community presence include partnering with Baltimore's chapter of Big Brothers, Big Sisters on a Know Your Rights program that law students put on for the organization's mentees, utilizing the university's connections with the surrounding community to place students with a focus on health law in Vivian V. Thomas High School classrooms and working with the university to place students focusing on environmental law in service positions at Franklin Square Elementary School. Ben Smith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith, you may begin. Well, uh, I'd like to go a little bit off um, the speech here and say that uh, I was counting up the number of letters of support that I got uh, during our halftime, and I lost count at 81, but I'm pretty sure I broke 100, which is far and away the most community support of any applicant to this office right now. And that represents educators, students, business owners, uh, and members of the community that I've worked with in the past. Now, you may notice a bit of an accent. Uh, as an adoptive son of Baltimore, I love the city for the same reasons an adopted son loves its parent. It gave me a home and the opportunity to build the life I'd always hoped for. Now, starting out, uh, that opportunity uh, to build was something that I saw in what's right with the city. But as I lived here a little bit longer, I realized there's also opportunity in what's wrong with the city. The challenges we face, poverty, homelessness, crime, drugs, struggling schools, and the fight to keep people in the city are visceral problems that savage people's lives. But the light in that darkness hard though it may be to see, is very much there. Our struggles, and yes, our failings, have shown us that old systems no longer work. Teaching to the test doesn't help students engage the world in a meaningful way. Tax breaks for businesses only matter if you develop a vital consumer base for them in the surrounding communities. The list goes on, but you get the point. Our shining light as a city is that we have the opportunity to strike a bold path into progressive ideas that have not yet failed us. I'm here to serve as a catalyst for those ideas and to build consensus around their execution so that the city of Baltimore experiences a renaissance in all conceivable areas, proving definitively that our best days are still ahead of us. And when I look at the community support that I have in those letters, compared to what else we've seen today, I know that I can build and coalesce that support. I can communicate effectively with the members of this district, 452 of which are students in my student body. And I'd also like to say that my ability to manage those constituents and to marshal that kind of port, uh, support shows how effective I can be with constituent services, which as we all know is the heart of what a good council person brings to the table. Thank you. Mr. Evitz will um, do this portion of the questions. What is your development, uh, what is your view on development in Baltimore, especially regarding large development, i.e. harbor development at State Center versus development in neighborhoods and communities? And what role should the city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? I bet you've got these questions memorized by this point. Uh, I think the phrasing of the question is very telling, though. Neighborhoods versus large developers, large development versus development in neighborhoods and communities. It shouldn't be one versus the other, and it doesn't have to be. I believe that large development is absolutely vital to the economic future of Baltimore, but its vitality rests in no small part on serving as a catalyst for neighborhood development. Now, we could debate the merits of projects like State Center and the competing groups that back or oppose them. And just so you don't think I'm dodging the question, I do support State Center. But that's not really the point. 
The real issue here, and what will continue to be the issue, is whether we as a city can attract business and the development they require while preserving the integrity that our most devoted citizens see in the neighborhoods they love. That is the role of a city council person, and that is the systemic answer to your question. These controversies can be avoided, or at the very least equitably solved, when the council person is an intermediary between the parties, rather than a backer of one seeking to appease or steamroll the others. It requires bringing the parties to the table and helping them see that the most profitable, predictable, and stable way to move forward is to find a middle ground rather than engaging in high stakes games of winner take all. Because my job as a council person is to make sure that at the end of the day, nobody, not the developer and not the neighborhood, goes home empty handed. I'll take the next one. Uh, the city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. <clears throat> what solutions do you offer for the communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th, especially along Martin Luther King Bo Jr. Boulevard and under I-83? Yes, sir. Well, uh, homelessness stems from some confluence of three main issues, drug addiction, lack of economic opportunity, and mental illness. I believe in an approach that accounts for all of these issues, and I'd like to say that though affordable housing is a necessary second step to that, it's not the first step, because many citizens uh, that are homeless are not in a position to be placed in those houses yet, and certainly don't have the financial means to keep them. Uh, the first step is targeted investment in community homes that give the homeless an opportunity to get off the street. It's imperative that they're given their own room and a sense of ownership over the place. This isn't just somewhere to spend the night. These homes must, of course, be staffed. It's essential that the staff include some level of psychological counseling, counseling and addiction therapy. In order to remain in the home, residents must remain clean and uphold any prescribed counseling regimen or medication. In exchange for opportunity, we're asking the residents for responsibility. Now, part of that responsibility ties to what they're gonna be doing. Utilizing the city's vacant lots and perhaps folding it within the Adopt-A-Lot program the residents will engage in community agriculture as part of their house responsibilities. This will give them the opportunity to learn new skills, entrepreneurial skills, to gain a sense of productivity and pride, and to earn money through correlative farmer's markets. Market revenue can also subsidize the homes, making it an affordable option for the city. The gardens and markets will also help with city beautification and give outside residents a reason to visit and eventually move into neighborhoods that they might not otherwise consider. I know y'all want to get out of here, so I'm trying to keep it quick for you. <laughs> okay. Um, considering what you know about the entire 11th, list the two issues that are a top priority in your estimation. Well, everything we've talked about today is a priority, and bold, energetic leadership requires making them as much. Of course, 90 second answers only leave so much time for details, so I'm going to try and talk about things we all know details on in order to give you some substance. I'd like to reference two projects uh, with regard to one priority, which is downtown development. That's Inner Harbor 2.0 and the Greater Baltimore Committee's proposal for updating and expanding the convention center, as well as the Sheridan beside it. If properly implemented with community support, these projects could help take our city to the next level. Though no plan is perfect, I'm very supportive of the principles for each. Now, just for some context on the convention center, it's only 300,000 square feet right now. It was built in 1979 and hasn't been updated since 1997, and it's competing with a 700,000 square foot convention center in DC. Now, the Greater Baltimore Committee's plan uh, proposes moving it up to 580,000 square feet, which isn't perfect, but it's an option that the city can actually afford. My other great concern is ensuring that Lexington Market fully utilizes the tremendous investment it's on the precipice of receiving. Now that requires two things. The first is bringing customers in from the adjoining University of Maryland Baltimore community, a task that I am better positioned to do than any other applicant before you today. The other is bringing residents into the area around the market and not just in the apartment complexes. The best thing to incentivize that and residential growth in Baltimore writ large is lowering what we all know to be a, an, an excessive property tax. Now, we've all talked about lowering the property tax, but nobody's actually put forward ideas as to how we can do that. What I'd like to propose is offsetting it with incremental, incremental increases to the hotel tax and or some combination of a nominal fee for solid waste collection, 
which is uh, both of those issues are controlled by the city council and the mayor, so that's something that we could actually get done here. Another great solution is offsetting the tax with gaming revenue, which would require the approval of the General Assembly and is precisely the kind of ambitious but attainable project that a council person should take on. Okay, question four. Do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? And please explain your response. Absolutely. The long and the short of it is that if we don't compete financially for business and development, someone else will. That's opportunity that Baltimore can't afford to lose. Tax breaks and public-private investment are the obvious ways to do so, and they're easy talking points. The question, though, is how do we incentivize development in a way that the city can afford, but that also preserves the sanctity of the neighborhoods that we love? As it stands now, the city sells its vacant properties whenever possible. That's part of the agreement anyone participating in the Adopt-A-Lot program must sign. But what I'd push for is providing such city-owned property at no cost to incoming developers who can demonstrate a sufficient long-term plan and funding and who also gain a simple majority of neighborhood association support by adjoining neighborhood associations in the area. It doesn't require the city to put up any money. It can mitigate the level of tax breaks the city must pledge, saving the city money in the long term, and could steer development to areas that might not otherwise be considered attractive by businesses and developers. It also doesn't disrupt otherwise perfectly functioning neighborhoods. My stance also requires attention to small business. Mom and pop stores are part of the fabric of this city's neighborhoods. They often render great products and services, but sometimes suffer on the business end. I would push for a robust, accessible, and comprehensive continuing education program for business owners administered and expanded uh, yearly by the city that allows us to give small business owners the tools they need to succeed. Let's, let's keep it going. If you're as hungry as I am, you're ready to get out of here. Okay. Uh, how do you think the city's doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? Thank you, sir. And thanks for putting up with me. Uh, the city's doing well in that it has dedicated men and women willing to hazard their lives to make sure that we stay safe. And that can be a cliche talking point to put out, but it's important to remember that it's meaningful and true because people do die in that line of work. It's doing well in that targeted cameras and rapid deployment both dissuade crime and respond quickly to it. But I'm here to speak about what can be done better, not about what's already working. The relationship between communities and the police is perhaps the city's greatest difficulty in crime stoppage. It's imperative that the community view police as a friend and an ally, as someone to be trusted. Cops used to walk beats, getting to know each neighborhood and its inhabitants. This gave them a position of moral authority in the neighborhood that they now tend to lack and it gave them the relationships to be a valuable source of information and support to the community, but also to gain that information and support from the community. Now, high crime communities often treat police with a Cosa Nostra-like silence. Cops should return to walking beats in the truest sense of the phrase. Further, programs allowing citizens to shadow off-duty cops on their beats, getting to know the officers and discussing the neighborhood as they see it are a must, and that shouldn't be an exceptional value-added program. It should be a living, breathing reality for every police officer on the force. I would push uh, also for each officer to have required attendance at neighborhood association meetings on a fixed basis in order to form a true relationship with the community that they serve. Um, please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. You read it like it's the first time. Uh, the fact is, many of the hurdles that our students face are not simply about education. The barriers that they encounter often stem from racial and economic inequity. No amount of funding in and of itself is sufficient to fix these ills. Further, though these ills often tie to the children's educa educational opportunities, the solution can't be found in the classroom alone. The type of programs I administer at my law school, Know Your Rights programs with Big Brothers Big Sisters, mock interview workshops with Digital Harbor High School, mentoring opportunities with Franklin Square Elementary and Vivian V. Thomas High, uh, mentoring healthcare track students on their capstone projects, and helping out with the community garden that the uh, elementary school has, are wonderful not just because they teach students skills, but because they break down social barriers. We need to find more opportunities to help students transition into the professional world and learn the social skills that will allow them to flourish there. Partnerships with local universities are a great example of that paradigm. 
Just as important, though, is a vigorous and expanded program that offers tax breaks to businesses who are willing to hire Baltimore City High School students part-time, as well as recent graduates. The city can also deploy the capital from our new casino that's tabbed for education to fund numerous students who win quarterly contests in entrepreneurship, providing them the base they need to become our city's next great engines of economic progress. How am I doing? Thumbs up? Great, thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, will you take 30 seconds and close for us, please? Okay, well, like I said, I really am grateful that y'all took the time to stay here. And I'm very aware of how I come off. I'm a, I'm a white guy from the law school, pacing around in a suit, and I'm, you know, I try to talk smoothly, I fight back the accent, and sure, that can play well in some of the more affluent areas of my district. Places that I spend quite a bit of time because I love the areas and because most of my friends live there. But I live in the building directly across from Lexington Market. And in spite of flirting with leaving the neighborhood, realized doing so would make me part of the neighborhood's problem. I walk home every night, knowing pedestrians are periodically shot in the blocks around my building, the last time happening a few blocks, ago on, uh, few blocks away on Sunday night. But I won't give up on the neighborhood, and I won't give up on Baltimore. After high school, I kicked around dead-end jobs and struggled to find some way to matter in the world. Eventually, I worked my way through community college, stigma though it entailed, and went to university searching for a way up in the world. I stand before you as someone who felt his life slipping into obscurity, but fought his way back to the light year after year. In many ways, that's the story of my neighborhood, and that's the story of Baltimore. We've fallen on hard times, but we're fighting our way back to the light. Now, I've lived the life of an upcoming professional in this city that many of my peers in places like Locust Point and Federal Hill and Bolton Hill have lived, but I also know, know what it feels like to be a youth, uh, like many of the downtown youths we have, who don't know that they have a sense of direction or somewhere that they can go. I understand what both constituencies put broadly in this community go through, and I want to build support between them that lifts them all up without driving people out, as the gentrification that we've seen in this city so often does. I've worked tirelessly creating community service opportunities because I want to bridge the gap that exists in District 11 between its neighborhoods. We all rise when we rise together, and with the help of your vote today, or tonight rather, I will give everything I have to make sure the sun rises on Baltimore in a better future for us all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great. We appreciate you. <laughs> and, uh, Seriously, uh, thank you for staying so late with us. Right. As Mr. Smith says, he by far has the largest uh, number of support letters. Um, I stopped counting at 81 like you. But uh, <laughs> it's too funny. <laughs> that youthful exuberance. <laughs> um, so, um, Ms. Ambridge, thank you for, for being patient. Our uh, last cap candidate uh, to speak before us this evening is Melanie Ambridge, and uh, glad to see the you. The lowest here. microphone yet. <laughs> glad to see you. Uh, you have someone that you wish to speak I don't. Unfortunately, my speaker sent a letter in. He had to work this evening okay. and couldn't make it. If, if I might take a point of personal privilege, though, I didn't say this earlier because I thought he would be coming forward, uh, but certainly uh, my colleague and um, my longtime friend, um, Anthony Ambridge, who we served together for eight years back in the heyday of the city council. Well, you, <laughs> you were in the heyday also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I just want to acknowledge uh, a former member of the council and, and a very good friend, um, Anthony Ambridge, who is with us this evening. Ms. Ambridge. I want to thank everyone for taking time from your schedules to participate in this hearing. I realize everyone now is probably as hungry and tired as I am. <laughs> but I hope you're all listening. Um, having volunteered in a nonprofit sector, worked and lived throughout the city, and having worked with my community association, I understand the importance of this selection. Your neighborhood comes first. We all have issues and concerns in our respected communities. Each concern is at the epicenter of your daily lives, whether it be housing, education, sanitation, crime, parking, traffic, or development. Each one will be equally important to me. 
I pledge to put neighborhoods first. Being a voice for my constituents is what I believe is the primary job of a city council member or any public servant. I believe in building consensus and forming coalitions, then articulating the wants and needs, desires of my constituents and neighbors to the best of my ability. I am principled and independent. <coughs> Can everyone hear me? My vote will reflect my constituents' views and my own. I will strive to form consensus through communication and discourse, ultimately building trust and cooperation. Local government is that which is closest to the people, where positive impact is most likely made and where my interests lie. Neighborhood first. We are all a city of neighborhoods. <coughs> Thank you, we appreciate that. I will uh, have the honor of uh, asking the questions of you this evening. What is your view on development in Baltimore, especially in regards to large development, that is, harbor development and state center, for example, not that is, but for example, harbor development and state center versus development in neighborhoods and communities. And what role should a city play in working with neighborhoods versus large developers? Um, I would like to start off by saying that um, I moved away from Baltimore for about 10 years. And one of the things that drove me back to the city was Harbor East development. I came home for a wedding and I thought, wow, my city grew up. I still have that same excitement living in Federal Hill, or South Baltimore, able to walk with my daughter to the parks and to the Inner Harbor almost every day this summer. Um, I think that large development is a positive thing for communities if it's done the right way. We have to weigh all the pros and cons. We have to listen to the developer's intentions for himself and for the community. Living very close to the casino that recently opened, um, I was kind of a, a voice for the neighborhood at the time, in the beginning, with my great concern and what the impact would be for my community. Thankfully, that we have a voice with the local, local development council. Um, and I think that's a, a great um, opening to say uh, um, the state center, an eco district like the state center, will provide a great opportunity for the neighborhood. Someone mentioned, um, actually everyone mentioned, large developments versus small businesses. I've seen that in most large developments in the city is an opportunity for small businesses to exist if it's a, a mixed use building. We just need to make sure that these large developers are offering pricing for small businesses to thrive. The small businesses is where the communities live and shop and, and do most of their daily activities. So I think that uh, large businesses can be a positive thing for communities. Um, and just as, as everyone else mentioned, um, it's not really a versus because I think that they can coexist um, and, and thrive. Uh, the, with the casino and with the local development money, it's giving us an opportunity to pr improve our infrastructure. That's very long overdue. Um. Thank you. The city has created beautiful, healthy communities where people choose to live and raise their families. What solutions do you offer for communities in the 11th district? How do you suggest transforming pockets of poverty and homelessness into thriving mixed income communities? How would you deal with the homelessness issues in the 11th district, especially on Long, Martin Luther King Boulevard and under I-83? This question covers a lot. Um, I think that, especially with the issue of the homelessness, I think that the city offers many opportunities for people to seek help. Some of the things that I think are important with that is that the facilities are for men, for women, and for families. That they offer help with mental health, substance abuse, jobs training, and basic life skills. It is important that these homeless people do become you know, willing and able to move into homes, but we can't, I mean, there's plenty of homes that they can move into. What we have to do is treat their initial problems that they have, <coughs> figure out why they're homeless, and help them lift up to work and to live within the community and to be able to move into the homes that are available in the city. Great, thank you. 
considering what you know about the entire 11th district, list the two issues that are top priority in your estimation. Well, it's hard to pick two issues. Um, each of our neighborhoods is different. Everyone pretty much covered the basics, education, public safety. Um, I think that with each neighborhood, it's important to listen to the constituents within the neighborhood. And as I said in my opening statement, we all have our issues that are important to us, and each one of those issues will be just as important to me. Um, some neighborhoods are worried about litter. Some neighborhoods are worried about gang shootings outside their front door. I think that each one of these is important for the council person to listen to the neighbors and listen to their constituents and bring each of them to the forefront of their um, decisions. Um, what was the rest of the question? Oh, uh, the different issues. Well, that pretty much covers it. I mean, we, we all know what we have in our own neighborhoods. I know what I have in my neighborhood. Um, and that's it. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you subscribe to the idea of providing financial incentives to businesses and developers to lure them into Baltimore? Please explain. I, I do indeed um, believe in the financial incentives to an extent. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the second question, or the first question rather, um, each development that's coming into the city needs to be examined. We need to make sure that whatever financial incentives we are giving to the developers and to the businesses to coming into our neighborhood, that developer and that business is going to have a positive impact on our communities. Are they going to offer jobs? Are the people going to live in the cities? Are, you know, are the, are the businesses going to be here long term? Will they need more financial incentives down the line? So I do believe in them, but I don't believe in them with, you know, with taking away from other important entities in the city, such as education and public safety. Thank you. How do you think the city is doing in dealing with crime and handling the relationship between communities and the police department? What would you do differently? I think that we need stronger community input. I grew up in a family with very many men as a member of the police departments. So when I look at a police officer in my neighborhood, I only have the utmost respect for that police officer. And I only wish that everybody in my community would be able to do the same thing. I do support the cameras on the police, but I, I really strongly feel that we shouldn't need that because we should look at the police department and smi put a smile on our face when we look at, at the police officers on the street. We shouldn't be scared or worried. Um, I think that if the community members get to know each other a little bit better and build trust amongst each other and trust the police department and communicate with the police department more, that they will be able to do their jobs better. I think that they have the toughest job on the street. I mean, they carry guns. They risk getting killed every single day to protect us. And I think that it's just our job to owe them the same respect and respect each other within the community, communicate with each other, and understand that we're all in this together. And if we don't communicate and we don't see something, say something when we see something, we're not going to help the police do their jobs any better. Thank you. Please state what you feel to be the one factor that could most effectively improve the city's education system and how you would recommend the city act upon that factor. I think the city has the tools to make the school system better. What I think we need to do, as a parent especially, is the parents need to be more involved in the student's education. We can build the best facilities have the best programs, have the best textbooks, the best computers, but if the parents are not involved with their children, none of it matters. I mean, the fact that a kid can sign himself out at school at 16 years old, it doesn't matter because the kid should be thinking about, if I sign myself out of school and I'm not supposed to be out of school, what is my parent going to say? The parents need to get involved. They need to know where their kids are. They need to you know, hold them accountable for their actions and help the, the, help the teachers 
per, be better teachers for the students. Become more involved, volunteer, know what classes your kids have, know your kids' friends, know your teachers' names. I think the city is giving us the tools to do what we need to do. I think it's the parents' jobs to step up and make sure that the school system is able to use all those tools. Great, thank you uh, for your uh, answers to all of the questions. You might now take 90 seconds to give you a closing comments. Thank you. In closing, my position on the council will be my full-time vocation. My office will be open and available. District 11 will be my first priority after my family, of course. We all want clean, safe neighborhoods, quality schools, and an environment conducive to job creation. Let's build those bridges between an extraordinary family life and a city of innovative, prosperous developments. And remember, neighborhoods first. Great, thank you. Um, we appreciate your being here this evening and, uh, and for your service in uh, your present community as well as across the community. We thank everybody, uh, all of the candidates and supporters and others who are here this evening. Um, I can speak for this committee that we're certainly um, impressed um, and uh, with the uh, enthusiasm and the talent and the ideas that are here. I'm hopeful that none of the candidates move into the 12th district in the next two years um, so that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that funny? But anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, before I uh, open uh, up the committee for uh, nominations, if they're so moved, here's uh, from the committee. Are there any comments uh, that you wish to put on the table before we move forward? There. I don't see any, huh? So there being none, I will uh, entertain nominations at this time. Is there any nominations or no? Mr. Harpool? I do want to make one comment. Use the microphone, please. Send it. I do want to make one comment as it relates to the um, letters of support. Yes. And if the council is um, tasked to go through, or the, if we're tasked to go through this sort of a process again, and I know again we're working in a really tight timeline, it would be, I think, helpful to me and perhaps maybe some of my uh, fellow members to have some idea. I know there are lots of letters, and, and I'm not even sure what the deadline was for those letters to come in, but it would probably be helpful for us, some of us to understand who submitted those letters, just in terms of what role they play in our community, Okay. in terms of our ability to be familiar with those individuals or organizations. Sure. Um, because we've had a limited amount of time to be exposed to some of these. Some of these folks, we, some of us know already, but it would be good to get an idea, just kind of round that out for those that we're less familiar with mm -hmm. as to who, it, who in our community supports the candidacy. Um, that aside, um, <laughs> this has been an exhaustive process. Um, I basically sort of put together sort of a score sheet. Yes, sir. And as um, the various candidates reply to the different questions, you know, in my own way, sort of summed up, um, counted sort of what I thought the response was on a one to 10 scale. Uh, most of them were, you know, fairly, um, fairly consistent, I think, in their answers and as, as the list grew on, obviously people were able, those who, who responded later were able to benefit from some of the answers they were given before. There were a number of presentations that I saw that were sort of scripted, if you will, and because the candidates had a chance to see those questions in advance, obviously some of them wrote some very uh, skillful responses and delivered those in very passionate ways. Um, we got some very brilliant um, presenters, and so you know, I also looked at sort of that sort of gravitas that they had as they presented that, um, and tried to imagine for myself what it would be like and sitting across the table or as a community member coming to see and meet with one of those council members, one of those people as council members, and having been as familiar as I have been and been to as many council meetings as I've been to, to look at how that person I thought fit into um, 
you know, the cadre of people that we have now or, or what it would be like to see them represent my district. Um, so with that in mind, and, and it's kind of interesting because what I was listening for was ideas. Uh, I heard a lot of rhetoric, um, but in my own little kind of scoring, there was one member or one candidate who I thought, um, while I didn't necessarily agree with all or don't think that necessarily all the ideas were the answers uh, to solving these problems, I don't think they could do it alone. Uh, they'll need the rest of you all, and they've all asked for everybody's support. But uh, I was impressed with one particular candidate who did offer, I thought, a number of, of concrete kind of suggestions or approaches or sort of a willingness to really roll up the sleeves. Um, and so I'm prepared to, um, to nominate Eric Costello. Thank you. Are there any other nomina nominations? Mr. Um, on behalf of Downtown Partnership, uh, I think the... Speak a little louder and, and uh, grab the microphone, please. The, uh, the breadth, uh, I, I agree with the, the, uh, my, my previous uh, panelists, the, uh, the breadth of, of knowledge and information that was presented here tonight was really impressive. I think we're fortunate uh, to have such a strong candidate, a uh, strong field of candidates uh, in the 11th, um, and that we have uh, you know, everyone from uh, you know, senior experienced politicians to community organizers to, to, to current students to um, uh, people really engaging in this city. Um, I, I would like to nominate uh, Greg Cilio. I think he did a, a, a fine I'm job. I'm sorry. I would like to nominate Mr. Cilio. Greg Cilio. Please. Are there any other nominations? And the letters, frankly, I, I know I should only be paying attention to here, but uh, they were still coming in, popping up on my phone um, as I was sitting here. Um, the letters were coming in today, and so we got a lot of late stuff. We did uh, try to put together best uh, as the staff could as many of the letters as possible. Um, everyone didn't follow the rules, frankly, and uh, I was getting letters. I should not have been getting any. They, it was a process to go. But having said that, we are here. Uh, I have two names for nomination. Uh, are there any nominations, any other nominations? There being none, the next step will be that I will call um, for vote on both names, Mr. Costello first and Mr. Cilio second. The, uh, if, if Mr. Costello receives a majority, uh, that will be their name going forward. If he fails to receive a majority, I will call Mr. Greg Cilio's name if he receives a majority, that would be the name going forward. If he does not receive uh, a majority, I, I will take other nominations or I will recall uh, the nominations that are before us. I will ask for a roll call, um, a yay, nay, or abstention. Um, I will call in alphabetical order the committee, except I will um, call Councilman Kraft uh, second to last, and I will, I will call myself the chair uh, last. So, uh, before us is the nomination of Eric Costello. Uh, your uh, response is either yay, nay, or abstain. Um, Mr. Alkele. Uh, yay. I'm sorry? Yay. yay. I'm a little hard of hearing. <laughs> Um, Best? Yes. yes. Laporte? Yay. Yay. Allen? Yay. Yes. Mitchell? Yay. Yes. Little? Yay. That is? Yay. Yes. Evitz? Nay. Sorry? Nay. Nay? Okay. Harpool? Yay. Freeman? Yay. No. Palumbo? Yay. Yay. Simmons? Yay. Yes. Kraft? Yes. Yes. Uh, Stokes? Yes. 
we count 11 yeas, two nays, no abstentions. Mr. Costello's name will go forward from this committee uh, to the full city council on October the 6th. Uh, before I close this, uh, I would make a motion and ask for an acclamation. Um, if there is a second, I will ask for it. If not, we'll let it go. Okay, so the vote is 11 to two um, for Mr. Costello to move forward. His name will move forward before the full city council on October the 6th. If the council should approve Mr. Costello on that evening, he will be sworn in and take his seat that night at the Baltimore City Council meeting. Thank you all. I, I appreciate and I thank you on behalf of the president uh, for all of the committee and I thank all of the candidates uh, for all of your great, great uh, work here this evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.